I bought a haunted piano on Craigslist. I am a musician. Not a terribly great one, but still, I consider myself a musician. I can play with the best of them, and I know my way around an instrument or two. More importantly, I am a collector. A collector of various items ranging from the odd to the obscure. There is no rhyme or reason to my collection. It consists of anything uniquely interesting I can get my hands on. That is why, when I saw an ad on Craigslist for a vintage, rustic, red piano, I couldn't help but reach out to the seller. The ad's title seemed normal enough old piano, free to a good home. I had seen countless like it before. Nothing out of the ordinary and certainly not something that would normally grab my attention. Still, I felt a strange need to click on it. Perhaps I was bored or maybe I just wanted to see what it looked like. Either way, I gave in to my compulsion. Upon clicking the ad, there was no picture. Just an anomalous but intriguing story. It reads something like this. I am offering my piano to anyone who is willing to come and pick it up. It is very old, but still playable. I can prove this upon your arrival. It is red and bears no brand markings. This is because it was made by my great-grandfather. It is one of a kind. He went out himself and chopped down a redwood tree to provide the material to build it. It took him many days to finally cut down the tree, and much, much longer to finish making the piano. Nearly his entire life was put into this thing. I, however, have no use for it. It has been passed down in my family many times over. I have no wish to continue the tradition, and the piano is currently taking up too much space in my home. I want it gone as quickly as possible. You can reach me by phone at the number listed below. Serious inquiries only, Margaret. Reading the ad sparked my curiosity. One of a kind, redwood tree. How strange and absurd, I had to see this thing. If it was half as remarkable as Margaret's description made it out to be, then it was a must-have for my ever-growing collection. As such, I decided to give her a call. Margaret answered the phone after the first ring and immediately asked, Is this about the piano? She was thrilled to hear I was interested. I too was thrilled, happy to know it was still available. We set up a time the next day for me to come over and take a look at it. I hung up the phone, excited as could be. I had a feeling this piano would become the new centerpiece of my collection. My antiques and oddities spanned many eras of history, as well as numerous countries. They ranged anywhere from the mundane to the wildly bizarre, but all of them were nothing if not great conversation pieces. Some of my favorites included a genuine voodoo doll from Louisiana, a tooth from a saber-toothed cat, a book of spells written by an alleged witch, and a piece of an antler from the world's largest moose. Being a musician, I also owned countless instruments, too many to list. Each time I acquired a new item, my heart would race with excitement, whatever it becoming the focus of my attention. The piano was no different. I couldn't wait to see it in person. I woke up the following day with no resistance to my alarm, swiftly starting my daily routine in an effort to minimize the time between me and Margaret. She said she was an early bird and that I could swing by early. With this in mind, I showered, brushed my teeth, and got dressed at a record pace making it out the door roughly 25 minutes after getting out of bed. It might sound silly to be so worked up over a material object, but to that I'd say you must not be a collector. Seeing this piano in person was my mission, and it was one I intended to see through to the end. I found myself at Margaret's home within the hour. It was a quaint cottage at the end of a dead-end road, surrounded by shrubbery and forest. There was an old tire swing in the backyard, indicating that it may have been where Margaret grew up. I wondered if her parents passed away and left her the house. Maybe the piano reminded her of them, and that was the real reason she was getting rid of it. My speculation was interrupted by a woman, racing out of the cottage to greet me. She signaled for me to come inside and went back in herself. This was no doubt Margaret. I hadn't identified myself in any way, but it wasn't likely that she received many visitors out where she was. Eager to see the piano, I quickly jumped out of my car and made my way up the stone walkway to the front door. Entering the house, Margaret seemed overjoyed to see me. It was jarring, but certainly made things a little less awkward. We exchanged a few pleasantries before she rushed me over to the room that housed the piano. She was excited to show me it, just as excited as I was to see it. I matched her pace as we made our way there. Upon entering, I stopped dead in my tracks. 
There, just a few yards away, was the piano in all of its glory. It was a beautiful concoction of wood and ivory, the likes of which I had never seen. It had such a striking red color, giving it an illustrious and bold finish, and the design was magnificent. Simple, yet elegant. Highly original, and certainly one of a kind like Margaret stated in her ad. I stood there for a moment, my mouth agape in awe. Margaret mistook my reaction for disinterest, quickly going off on a sales pitch about its charm and history. She then sat down at its stool and placed her hands over the keys. I tuned it yesterday after your call. Let's hear how it sounds. Margaret played a beautiful piece. In addition to playing, she sang. This is when I took my attention away from the piano and allowed myself to notice her. She was young, maybe in her late twenties, beautiful slender. She had silver highlights in her hair, giving it a strange albeit lovely luster. Her singing voice accompanied by the wonderfully rich tone of the piano captivated me in a way that I can't put into words. I allowed myself to be taken by the song until she finished. Before I could compliment her, Margaret continued her well-rehearsed sales pitch. I don't know if it was her playing or her voice, but I was sold the minute she touched the keys. Because of this, I interrupted her. I'll take it. She was astounded when I said this. Really? You will? Wonderful. We were both happy and everything seemed fine, but one fact kept creeping and crawling in the back of my mind. The history of each piece in my collection was very important to me, and the pianos had gaps that needed to be filled. So, have you lived in this house your whole life? I asked, secretly fishing for information. Yes, as did my parents. This house is very old. Older than the piano. And your great-grandfather, he lived here as well? I asked. Yes, he did. Well, redwoods only grow in California, and they're truly massive. It seems unlikely that he would have made the trek out there, or even have been able to chop one down, especially with the many trees here at his disposal. It was at this point that Margaret realized I had caught her in a lie. She apologized to me and came clean. It would seem that the piano was made from a red tree, just not a redwood. Instead, it was a strange tree located deep in a nearby forest. Being an avid historian, Margaret's great-grandfather knew all about it. This particular tree was a local legend, and it had always been his dream to find it. It was known as the Blood Tree, a sacred place of Native American worship from a time long since past. Anyone who touched it was said to live a long life filled with luck and prosperity. Those who wounded it, however, would forever know fear and misfortune. Her great-grandfather, of course, fell into the latter category. Though she claimed to not believe in the legend, she was worried the curse would scare off anyone who wanted it. Dark past or not, I still wanted it, even more than I had previously. Despite Margaret's deception, I attempted to offer her money. She wouldn't have it, insisting I just take the thing off her hands. That would have been fine, but I couldn't bring myself to offer nothing in return. Eventually, I broke her down, handing over an envelope with a few hundred bucks in it. She reluctantly accepted and helped me lift the thing into the bed of my truck. I waved and drove off, satisfied with my purchase. Later on, with the help of a friend, I positioned it in the perfect spot in my living room. I had a new piece for the collection, and all was right in the world, or so I thought. For a few days, my life continued as it normally did. My routine remained unchanged. The only difference was the new piece of furniture that grabbed my attention whenever I entered the room. After a while, I barely noticed it was there. Despite its beauty, it soon blended in with the rest of my home, much like the other items in my collection. One night, however, changed this. I had just laid down and begun drifting into a light sleep when a loud bang downstairs jolted me awake. I jumped out of bed and took a moment to gather my wits. The sound was unmistakably the piano's fallboard slamming shut over the keys. That could easily happen on its own had I left it open. This was not the case. I hadn't played the piano once since I procured it. So what created the sound? I raced downstairs in an effort to satisfy my curiosity and put my mind at ease. What I found did neither. The piano's fallboard was up. Not only had it not shut over the keys, but it was inexplicably open despite my never touching it. Confusion swam through my brain, but soon submitted to the clutches of late-night weariness. In an effort to make sense of things, I shut the fallboard and chalked up the noise to an animal outside before venturing back to bed. 
nothing to worry about. The next day was pretty normal at first. I woke up early, took a shower, brushed my teeth, and started my commute. I worked and dealt with the stress that came along with it, just as I always did. The piano was the farthest thing from my mind. It wasn't until I got home that it crept its way back in. Upon opening the door to my house, I was greeted by a cold gust that rushed out from within. I hadn't left the AC on, so this was strange. I walked into the living room and set my jacket on the couch. I then looked up and noticed the piano. The fallboard. It was up. That couldn't be. I shut it the night before. Had someone broken in? I sped around my house, a kitchen knife in hand, ready to attack any would-be intruder. There was no one. After checking every inch of the house, I eventually found myself back in the living room in front of the piano. The fallboard was now down. Was I going mad? No, of course not. This was just the byproduct of an exhausted, overworked mind, nothing more. At least that's what I told myself to keep from dwelling on it. Still somewhat frazzled, I escaped to my bedroom and attempted to catch some shut eye. After changing out of my work attire and into my nightwear, my body fell into bed. An ocean of warm blankets and pillows enveloping me. A good end to a bad day, I thought. As luck would have it, sleep would elude my grasp. Quickly after closing my eyes, there was another sound downstairs. This time it wasn't the fallboard. No, it was music. Not just any music, either. It was the piano. With nothing but adrenaline to guide me, I ran downstairs to see what was going on. Upon reaching the bottom step, the music stopped and I watched as the fallboard slammed itself shut over the keys. My heart sank as I stood in place, shocked. When the moment passed, I ran back to my room and locked the door behind me. A vile mixture of fear and dismay crept under the covers with me. Company often kept when hiding from creatures in the dark, by products of overactive imaginations. This monster, however, was all too real. The sound of my alarm woke me the next day. I was surprised I slept, wondering if the previous night was a bad dream. This wasn't the case, but my mind gave in to the notion. Living in a state of denial was better than living in a world where pianos came to life. It was a splendid defense mechanism, and one that allowed me to go about my day without fear or unease. I left, went to work, came home, and went to bed. Everything was back to normal, just as I told myself it was. But lies only stretched so far. The familiar pang of ivory keys snuck into my room as panic set in again. That's when it hit me. This wasn't paranormal, it couldn't be. It was a cheap parlor trick. Margaret must have outfitted the piano to play itself, much like the player pianos of old. This was just a prank, a laugh at my expense. That's why the damned thing was free. I ran downstairs to solve the mystery once and for all. Like clockwork, as soon as my foot touched the bottom step, the piano stopped playing. I walked over to it nonchalantly, confident in my new theory. Upon opening it up and exploring all of its crevices, I was surprised by what I saw. It was just a normal piano. Nothing extra was added in its creation to make it play on its own. Nothing at all. My calm demeanor vanished. I stared at the red wood and ivory keys before me and almost felt compelled to ask, What are you? Instead, I remained silent. This silence, however, was quickly obliterated by the sound of music as the piano began playing itself once again. I wanted to run, but terror kept me still. I watched the horror unfold. The keys were pressed down hard, controlled by an unseen force. A haunting peace filled the room as pictures fell from the walls. The house began to shake around me. My eyes darted back and forth in fear, but then noticed something outside. Standing at my window was a shadowy figure. It took off before the moonlight could reveal its identity. This was enough to break my trance. I ran outside to escape the madness. All the while, the song raged on. The house continued to shake behind me. The dark figure was nowhere to be seen. Margaret had not rigged the piano to play on its own, but I was not losing my marbles either. This was something entirely different, something not of this world. All at once, the music stopped and the world around me with it. No wind, no cars, no animals, and no people. Nothing. It was the middle of the night at this point, but where were the crickets chirping, the frogs croaking, the trees swaying? Where was the life outside my home? A little exploration revealed that I was truly by myself. Every living creature in the vicinity had disappeared. 
What the hell was going on? Why was this happening? I returned home, hoping for answers, but was instead greeted with an unsettling sight. It was so dark I almost didn't see it. Standing completely still next to the piano was that same silhouette from my window. My body instinctively jolted out of fear, but the figure did not react. It was frozen like the rest of the world. I took this opportune moment to investigate. The entity was wearing a dark cloak, one that covered its entire body. At its face was nothing but pure darkness. I cautiously attempted to pull away the shroud from its head, but it would not budge. I studied the figure for a few more moments before a familiar sound filled the room. The piano's song recommenced, and in an instant the world returned to life. A vortex of dark energy swirled around the shadowy figure as it reached out for me with skeletal hands. I fell back, but managed to escape unscathed, crawling out the front door in an awkward slur of motion. Rushing over to my car, I got in and took off with no specific location in mind, happy to be anywhere that wasn't my own home. During my drive, I weighed my options. Destroying the piano came to mind, but the risk outweighed the reward. It could just as easily backfire, angering whatever spirit was haunting its keys. Seeking help wasn't really an option either. The only person who might believe me was Margaret. That was it. Margaret, maybe she would know what to do. My tires left tread marks on the road as they peeled off in the direction of Margaret's house. The whole drive was a blur, my mind in dire straits over the piano and its ghost, but luckily the trip was a short one. It was late, but I didn't care. With the car parked in the driveway, my still shaking legs carried me up the walkway towards the front door. My march, however, was impeded. The cloaked figure was there, standing at the door to Margaret's house. Before I could so much as turn in the opposite direction, it grabbed me by the arm with its bony fingers. Its vicious strength kept me anchored in place. My body cowered as it leaned over me, almost as if to say, leave this place. Its grip wavered for a moment, allowing me a small window of opportunity to escape. I hightailed it out of there without looking back. Defeated, I had no choice but to return home. I hesitantly stepped past the piano and walked up to my bedroom, where I locked the door and fell onto my bed, mentally exhausted. I would not have even a moment of solace as the song started up again the second my head hit the pillow. The house quaked beneath me, but I remained still, sick of the repetition. The banging on my bedroom door that followed, however, succeeded in startling me. I jumped out of bed and pushed my dresser to the door. Hiding beneath my sheets, I attempted to tune out the ruckus around me. The banging persisted, but I chose to instead focus on the song, allowing myself to properly listen to it for the first time. Surprisingly enough, it was beautiful. Dark and sullen, but beautiful. Its melody soothed me, relaxing me to the point that my eyes grew tired. Despite the pandemonium, I fell asleep and dreamt. The dream world I found myself in was different from that of my usual dreamscapes. It was overwhelmingly vivid and ambient. Words like surreal and otherworldly just don't cut it. The awareness I had is also difficult to explain. Lucidity is too small a concept. I was completely aware of my surroundings in the sense that I could feel everything about them. Their history, their purpose, and their place in relation to the rest of the world. I know that doesn't make much sense, but it's the only description I have to offer. The dream's visual makeup was that of a forest. It was dense, but my astral form floated to a clearing past the roots and branches. It was a large meadow, and at its center a large red tree. Every fiber of my being knew where I was. This was the blood tree, the precursor to my piano, the building blocks of a haunting in the form of a sacred plant. As I marveled at the beauty of the blood tree, a person stepped out from behind it, a Native American. He didn't speak. He simply pointed at the tree. This is when the piano leaked into my dream. The song played as glowing lines ran up and down the tree's bark. The Native American put his hand to the wood, motioning for me to do the same. Bewildered and awestruck, I obliged. The glowing lines raced past my skin. It was an incredible sensation. As these lines traveled, my eyes were filled with visions, a glimpse into the blood trees past. Its bark wasn't always red. Willing Native Americans came up to the tree every year, sliced their hands open, and placed them around its trunk. Their blood then dripped to its base, representing the lifelines of their people. 
It also signified becoming one with nature, feeding the tree life from within. It was the anchor that kept their community together. This is where they gathered and enjoyed life, a place free from worry or judgment, a place of peace. More moments came to me as the glowing lines circled our hands. This was also where the natives buried their dead. After placing one of their own in the earth, one of the elders would play a song on what appeared to be an ocarina. The same song my piano played every night. It was their song of death. When it was all over, a final offering of blood was taken from the fallen and painted onto the blood tree, granting their spirit safe passage to the afterlife. When the vision ceased, my new friend released his hand from the bark, reached into his satchel, and pulled out an ocarina. He began playing the song of death, but then stopped. He handed it over and motioned for me to play instead. I wasn't sure what he was up to, but felt no need to defy his wishes. With a little practice, I was able to get the hang of the instrument and play the song he sought to hear. As I played, the blood tree began wilting, its bark changing from red to black. My friend was ecstatic. For one reason or another, this is what he wanted. It wasn't until I woke moments later in bed that the pieces of the puzzle clicked into place. Margaret's ancestor had taken away the native's headstone. More than that, he violated their connection to nature as well as with one another. The tree and its spirits had to be put to rest once and for all, and there was only one way to do this. I can't explain how, but I knew I needed to play the song of death on the piano, the whole way through, without interruption. It was the only thing that would break the curse. I ran downstairs and put my plan into action. When my hands touched the keys, the house violently shook, knocking frames and furniture all over the place. I kept my composure. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the dark figure standing at my window again. Still, I continued, I had an obligation to persevere if not for the tree or its ghosts, then for myself. The nightmare had to end. The cloaked entity materialized at different spots in the room, sometimes next to me, other times breathing down my neck. I paid it no attention despite my fear. I had come too far to let my balance waver now. Just as the shadowy figure sat next to me at the piano, I struck the final note of the song. The madness around me stopped. A weight was lifted from my shoulders and those of many others. I turned to the figure beside me and noticed the pelt of dark energy surrounding it was no longer there. It reached up and pulled the shroud from its face, revealing its identity. It was the Native American from my dream. He threw me a thankful smile before vanishing, happy to be released from his purgatory. I too was elated. The ordeal was over, and countless spirits could rest easy, free to cross over to the other side. My work was done. Months have passed, and the piano remains in my living room, quieter than it's ever been before. I even play it from time to time. If there's one thing you can take away from my experience, it's to be mindful of the things that go bump in the night. Some of them might just be wayward souls trying to communicate, begging for a chance to be heard by the living. Try your best not to be frightened. You might be surprised by what you can do to help. And please, let this tale be a warning to you. Don't ever buy strange things from Craigslist. You'll thank me later. Recently, my Boston Terrier ripped up my daughter's favorite bean bag. We'd been searching on Craigslist for weeks and none drew her attention until this bright pink Hello Kitty bean bag chair popped up for only $10. It seemed a little suspicious to me, so I went to John Mayer 1989's account, and there were no reviews. I realized at that time I could either disappoint my daughter or man up and take the risk. So I hit John Mayer 1989 up and I said, Strong Single Dad 1, Hey, I am interested in your pink Hello Kitty bean bag. I would like to set up a time and place to meet. Then I listed my number, which I won't list here. A few hours later, John Mayer responded. John Mayer 1989. Sure. I would like to meet you at Crossing Road at 10 p.m. Strong Single Dad 1. Can we meet around 5 p.m.? John Mayer 1989. I don't get off until 9.30, so I don't think that will work. 10 will have to do. Strong Single Dad 1. Okay, then can we at least meet at a specific location? John Mayer 1989. Yes. How about we meet at Walmart parking lot at 10 p.m.? Does that work? Strong Single Dad 1. Yes. Sounds great. See you then. The day passed. 
It was about 9.30 and I decided it was time to take off. My daughter wanted to go with me so we got in the car and drove to the Walmart parking lot. When we got there, the only lights were from the street lamp and the lot was nearly empty. It was now 10 so I texted John Mayer. Hey, I am here. Where are you? He responded. My truck broke down at Crossing Road. We can either call this off or you can come meet me here. I had a bad feeling in my gut, but my daughter was begging for the chair and said she would never forgive me if I didn't get her the hot pink Hello Kitty bean bag. So I started up my engine and I put Crossing Road in maps. It said it was located five minutes away, so I drove and parked on the side of the road. Surrounding me was deep woods on both sides. I texted John Mayer. I'm on Crossing Road. I don't see any other cars, she said. I see you just come out. Just walk straight ahead. I have the bean bag. I told my daughter to stay in the car, and I locked her in safely and got out with my wallet. I figured I couldn't see him because his truck had broken down, and it was too dark to see more than ten feet ahead of me without the help of another's headlights. I walked down the street using my phone flashlight, and the closer I got the more suspicious it started to seem. I saw a man emerge from the woods holding what appeared to be a bean bag. The man looked decently normal. He had a tall and muscular build with wiry hair and a crooked smile. The closer I got to him, the more off-putting he seemed to be. He was very jittery, darting his eyes everywhere but at me. I walked toward him and said, Hey man, I'm here for the bean bag. The man said, Oh yeah, I got the bean bag, right here. I shined my light and inspected it. It looked nothing like the bean bag in the ad. It was dirty and spotted with brown and red stains, and it looked like it had been staying in the woods with him for days. I immediately noticed a foul stench. He tried to hand me the bean bag while smiling a very creepy smile. I said, I'm not paying for this. It will cost me more than ten dollars to refurbish it. The man's expression immediately changed. Two cars pulled up beside us, driving headlightless in the dark. That was my first clue that they had no regard for other people's well-being and might be accomplices of this strange man. As their doors flew open, John Mayer threw the beanbag at me. It was much heavier than I expected. I stumbled as I caught it. The three men lunged toward me. I caught a glimpse of something sinister in their hands, so I ran as fast as I could toward my car and locked myself and our new piece of furniture inside. Outside, all three men were banging their heads against my window. The thud of skull on glass was sickening. I started my engine as fast as I could while trying to explain to my daughter what was happening. We zoomed down the road and never looked back. Once home, we were both rattled but safe. I let my daughter watch Octonauts while I got to work in my craft room, drenching that rotten sack with stain remover and osium. I finally put my screen printing skills to good use and with a few Google images of Miss Hello Kitty herself. I was able to make the beanbag look pretty close to as advertised. Although I did give the seller a poor rating, the experience could have been a lot worse. One thing has been strange though. The beanbag won't stop leaking. Styrofoam balls, sure, but sometimes I swear it's more than that. I'll find a dead rat on the floor and have no idea how it got there. The other day I found a doll's head. And when I am very sure my daughter is asleep, I hear the scariest moan of a serenade float from under her bedroom door. So, John Mayer 1989, let's not meet again. I do charity work time to time and mental health is very close to my heart. I was curiously hopping about personal adverts on Craigslist and I saw someone asking for company before they passed away. It didn't say much more beyond this, aside from the call being over webcam because they couldn't leave their home. I responded because I had been interested in end-of-life care, but I had always been quite scared about how it would affect me. I have cared for people who eventually died, but I never really saw it leading up to that point as they were usually taken into hospices. A few days later they responded, and they told me their name was Gerald, and they were in their early fifties. We arranged a call over WhatsApp in a few days. So a couple of days later I sat down for the call at my computer and took the call. He was an older man as said, short gray hair and slightly gaunt. His accent was West Country English and he wore prescription glasses. He didn't appear unwell, but often people don't. We spoke for a while 
and he explained how he made his money in selling specialist farming equipment, which was more interesting than I thought. His wife and daughter left him around a decade before so he took his money and moved to Asia. I was curious as to what his diagnosis was, but it wasn't for me to ask. He explained, however, that he would not survive until tomorrow. This raised a flag because from my perspective he didn't seem outwardly unwell, but he was firm that this day was his last which points to either paranoia or self-harm. In this situation I pressed him a little to ascertain his location. WhatsApp was encrypted and the number he was using appeared to be Norwegian. I asked him about this and he told me he was using an online SIM card and using a proxy. When I asked why, he explained that people were looking for him to take him away and he would die before he would let that happen. I told him I would find him help and I googled unaliving yourself crisis teams to call him, but he told me that if I stopped talking to him, he would just change his number and change his location via his VPN. Then things took a darker turn and he took out a small revolver pistol and showed me it was loaded with three bullets. He said he wanted to show me his home and took me on a tour around his house. I was speechless really, I didn't know how to respond, but I thought maybe if I stayed with him I could help, because at that point I didn't know what I could do. His house was large and the garden was surrounded by tropics of some variety. Unfortunately, I don't know much about plants so I couldn't work out where he was. He spoke about this being his legacy and how they wanted to take it away from him. He then told me he wanted to show me something and he opened a door to his basement which had a large lock. Switching the lights on I saw a woman and a child. He told me it was his wife and daughter. His wife threatened him with divorce and taking his daughter away and his money. The police were looking for them and the net was closing in. I wish I had have said something but I was in shock. He asked if I was watching and then shot his daughter in the head. It was so surreal I knew it was real but I hoped it was a sick prank while the woman screamed for a moment before he made me watch her be shot too. I was silent and felt incredibly sick. He put the camera down to face him and explained that they tried to take his legacy from him, but he knew he would never get away with it. He would end on his own terms. He leaned over to a jerry can and pushed it over. He lit a cigarette and threw the match nearby the gas and it ignited. The last thing I remember him telling me is that he called me so he knew he would be remembered and that I would never forget his face, and then he hung up. kind of late to the party, but a year ago I traveled to USA to work as a J1. I needed accommodation so I looked it up in Craigslist. After a few weeks of desperation I found a lady who had a room for me for $125 per week. It was 15 miles away from my workplace and I intended to go on bike. This would be my first error due to I would have to wake up at 5 a.m. to be at work at 6 a.m. Massachusetts mornings are cold even in summer and I'm not fit enough to ride 30 miles per day. When I got there the house was just a mess. The pictures I saw were from years ago before she lost his husband to a heart attack. I didn't have a proper bed, just a mattress in the floor. Not even a table with a chair. Welp, those were going to be a long four months, but as optimistic as I was, I thought I would survive. A couple days after my arrival, at least three of them, she was drinking beer non-stop. On the fourth, she tried to flirt with me. I haven't described her yet. She was a 45-plus-year-old really fat woman. Classic U.S. A stereotype. The situation got really awkward and I had to turn her off for good. Next day night she was drunk and she told me she was sorry and that she had PTSD since his husband died. Then she told me that his husband was a supporter of IRA back then. My what? That was the point when I decided that I would leave that place for good. A couple of friends were staying in a motel five miles away from work for $165 per week and there was room for me. So I packed my things and left that woman for good. For like two weeks I received calls from her telling me to come back, that she needed the money and stuff. Never contacted her again. My sister's cat had run away, it was five months later, and she was ready for a new furry friend. We scour a couple sites, and of course, Craigslist was one of them. We see a cute cat Molly, black and white, fixed, shots, chip, good disposition, and precious as all hell. 
Now we aren't totally naive, we expect to meet them, and maybe she's missing a leg or is feral, is in a meth den, etc. We are no stranger to the weird Craigslist stuff. It sounded too good to be true, but we texted them and it seemed normal enough, though they wanted us to meet at their house. My sister's a bad bitch with knuckle tattoos, and I could probably give a mean minor bruise, so we felt capable. We drive to this place like 15 minutes away. Typical middle-class neighborhood similar to ours. We knock, and some normal 30-something couple answers the door. Normal clean house, maybe a box in the corner. Okay, so not apparently a crack den. We come in and see multiple pits behind a baby gate, lightly whining, but not acting crazy. They're cute, and we like pit bulls. We talk to them about the cat's history. She is a single cat in a house with four enormous dogs. So she is not only cool, these people are good pet owners, Aka, four giant dogs, and the cat still is alive. So far, so good. We pick her up off the couch, hold her, and since my sister was planning on having children soon, she did the let me bug you a lil the way a baby would, pull an ear, paw, etc. test. She acted totally cool with it. She meowed a lot, was cute, didn't act crazy at all. Yay, we load up her food, cage, bed, etc. and take her home. She slowly becomes the subject of our affections. We take pictures of her, play the works. Molly is the cutest damn cat ever. A couple months and she starts acting. Weird. Midnight yowling like an owl being gutted or something. My sister has had cats and said, Uh, I think she's in heat. Which is odd because she was supposedly fixed. She proceeds to be in heat for weeks, out of it for a week, then right back and after that. We are haunted by a yowling demon, and we know we ought to get her fixed, but saw an ad that said in a couple months there would be a free spay or neuter event at the animal shelter. We figure we save the $200-$400 and live with the haunting a bit longer. I mean, it's not like she's injured or something, she just hasn't been fixed. She was a little odd. She reeled her head back and rolled it, and was kind of like an alien chanting. Nice acted basically like a dog with strangers would run up to them and meow incessantly. She bites your nose when you sleep to remind you to feed her. She isn't terrible, but to people with less patience, we can definitely see why they gave her away free. The time comes around and we take her to the vet. They tell us that the owners 100% lied to us. Not only is she not fixed, she's not vaccinated and not chipped either. My aunt is a vet and told us that she probably had a neurological condition as well, based on her strange body movements. We fix her and she proceeds to gain like 15 pounds. We were feeding her the same amount and learned that sometimes fixed cats get fat. But I mean, she was slinky when we got her. Now she is just kind of pudgy mama cat. Fast forward, sister has a baby and Molly is the ultimate protector of her. Baby has started grabbing and Molly hasn't gotten mad at the baby once, though a couple face pullings and she scampers off. We actually learned that she is a ragdoll. The owners got her in a shelter and they hadn't paid much attention to what type of cat she is. In 2008, I went to buy a new camera that I really wanted. It was a specific brand and model I had been searching for. At that time, it was considered one of the best cameras available, and I found a guy selling it on Craigslist for nearly half the regular price. I asked him why he was selling it so cheap and he explained that he accidentally scratched it on the sides, making it difficult to return or sell through official channels. After hearing this, I thought, well, I'm interested in taking photos, not how the camera looks, so I decided to go and check it out. The guy lived in some apartments further into the city. I lived outside the city, but I had a car, and it was only about a 20-minute drive, so I decided to drive there to pick it up. Luckily, I wasn't home at that time and was also pretty close to where he lived, so I told him I'd be there in 15 or 20 minutes and that I'd knock on his door. He gave me his apartment number and the address, so I headed there and parked my car on the street. So I walked up the stairs all the way to the sixth floor, which is where he said he lived. Then I found the right door number and knocked as I stood there in the hallway. I heard lots of loud shouting and screaming from nearby apartments. I thought maybe people were arguing, but I also realized that this area might not be in the best shape, or that the apartments were inexpensive to rent. However, I didn't pay much attention to the noise around me, not trying to act fancy or anything, but I knew I was in a neighborhood that wasn't the best. 
Finally, I knocked on the guy's door and he opened it. His wife was with him and they had just finished dinner watching TV. He handed me the camera and it was still in its box with all the instructions and accessories and it seemed to be in good working condition. He pointed out the scratches he had mentioned earlier and they were quite significant. They were deep and had left marks on the camera's surface. However, the camera still worked fine from what I could tell and everything else was in perfect condition so I gave him the money and left with the camera. As I was about to leave the apartment building, I opened the main door, and the screams and shouts from another apartment grew even louder. They were coming from one of the doors across the hall. The guy who sold me the camera was seeing me off and about to hold the door open to say goodbye when suddenly there was a loud banging on a door just a couple of feet away from us. The door swung open and there was another loud bang, but no one came out. Then we heard what sounded like three gunshots. I immediately rushed back into the apartment, and the guy quickly closed and locked the door. He put a chain across it and dialed 911 right away. He explained that the couple who lived across from him often argued, but nothing like this had ever happened before. The police arrived with a whole team, including officers with guns, and they went into the house. To make a long story short, they talked to the guy inside and it turned out he had fired those shots as a warning because he was having a big argument with his family and they weren't listening to him. The police took away all his guns, but I never heard anything more about that guy after that. Well, getting that camera turned out to be quite an adventure, but even now, over 10 years later, I've used it to take some really cool photos and it still works perfectly. I had a 27 a Mac for sale on Craigslist, and apparently the price was too cheap because I was receiving texts almost immediately after posting it. After about the sixth or so, I said the first person to actually show up will get it. I've had many people no show me with Craigslist in the past. To my surprise, a nice older couple showed up within 30 minutes, paid for it, and went on their way. I promptly deleted the ad and texted the other people that it had been sold. About three hours later, a large man shows up at my door asking about the Amac. I told him it was sold hours ago and that he should have gotten my text. He tells me that he responded to that text that he was on his way. I nicely described to him what first come, first serve meant, and he begins to shout. I was going to the bank. My mom loaned me the money. Why did you sell it? I apologized and asked him to leave. As I go to close the door, he blocks the door with his foot and asks how he's going to tell his mom that it was sold. I told him it wasn't my problem and to get out. The man angrily begins pacing around my front yard for at least 10 minutes screaming to someone on his cell phone. He then sits in his car for an hour. I try to ignore it, but eventually I walk outside to confront him and he speeds away, peeling out his tires. After that, my neighbors thought he was some weird estranged friend or something. I stopped giving my address away after that. I moved into an apartment and realized there wasn't a microwave, so I checked listings on Craigslist. Found one that said make an offer, so I texted an offer for $20. Asked for a picture of the inside, the posting only had one of the outside, and he sends me a mostly clean-looking microwave interior. We meet up at a Target parking lot, and it's just turned dark, so I give him the $20, throw it in my car, and go home. I notice it's kind of dusty, so I figure I'll have to give it a good cleaning when I get home. Bring it inside, and the entire top of the inside of the microwave is caked in red gunk, so I grab some disinfectant and start scrubbing. At least it was only $20, right? Well, as I was moving the microwave around to get to harder to reach spots to clean, I hear something rattle and fall out. I look around on my counter and find the top half of a human molar. As I'm staring at this broken toothpiece, my imagination suddenly turns all the gunk on the microwave into blood and guts as I imagine someone's head being microwaved until it explodes. Not sure if I'll ever use Craigslist again. when my friend told me that he hooked up with a random girl from Craigslist. I thought he was insane, but I'm sure most geniuses sound crazy. Even after he attributed his great night to luck, I still felt inclined to try it. After a couple days of browsing and a couple drinks too many, I posted my first ad. 
I gave out the details and some flexibility just to ensure I get something tonight. I started cleaning up and I checked the time. Hey man, I posted my ad. Just to be safe, what should I do? I don't want to give out my address and shit to some serial killer or something lol f, I hate cleaning. I straighten up some more until I hear my phone vibrate. Definitely call her so you can make sure it's a girl and you might be able to tell if she's hot el mao. Let me know when she's on her way or whatever, I'll call you to make sure everything is okay cool. Enjoy bro. Before replying, I decided to check my email to see if anyone replied. The spam is easy to weed out thanks to me asking for a specific subject. After four emails of, can you send pics and a number, I finally got the email I've been waiting for. Pretty woman in her mid-thirties cheating on her neglectful husband. Potential sob story, but I'm not the one to mediate things like this. I called and we talked for a few so things weren't as awkward when she got here. She's on her way. I'll see you tomorrow. I hurried to the kitchen and made some drinks and added some final spruces to my place. After 30 minutes of terrible anticipation and increasing hoariness, my phone vibrated. I'm outside, what door were you? Opting for safety, I decided to just meet her outside and lead her in. I did a quick double check in the mirror before heading out, but when I did, it made it all worth it. Who knew beautiful women like this looked for anonymous sex on the internet? All negative thoughts left my mind when I grabbed her hand, and they were quickly replaced with dirtier and dirtier ones when I led her into my apartment. I made some drinks while she sat on the couch. We made some idle conversation, mainly about how often we do this and blah blah. Surprisingly, this isn't my first time doing this, she told me almost breaking down. Instead of prying more, I just advanced the convo and asked her what all she likes to do. I managed to slip in that it was my first time doing this. She kissed me and asked me for directions to the bedroom. I got up and reached for her hand. When I turned around, I noticed she was looking in her purse. I guess she didn't notice me because she was looking for a while, but she smiled reassuringly when I told her that I already had condoms. We laid in bed and took each other's clothes off, but she suddenly got up and went to the bathroom. Could you get me another drink, please? She called out from the bathroom. Same thing you were drinking. I walked out and laughed at craziness of the situation. I don't know what compelled me to look through her purse, but I'm glad I did. I walked back into the room right as she came out looking worried and asked if I could call her cell phone. Of course, I happily obliged, and while she looked for that, she asked me if I could grab her purse from the front room because she had a surprise for me. Hey, is this you calling me? This isn't the same number you gave me, she laughed. Oh yeah, my friend told me to do that for Craigslist until we meet, I said as I grabbed her purse. Really, why? He said it's because you really, really shouldn't trust people you meet on the Craigslist, I replied as I locked the door. About a three years ago, I was obsessed with Craigslist. I would go on there to find anything I needed, it seems more like an addiction now. I had just turned 17, and I was the only person in my homeroom class with a license, but no car. Of course, I went to Craigslist to find a car at a reasonable price. I was strolling through the different variety of cars when I stumbled upon one in my price range. It was a 2008 Ford Explorer, only $3,000. At the time, I wasn't entirely sure why it was so cheap, but I was naive. I clicked on the picture and read the description. It seemed harmless enough. I wanted to get rid of this car because it was my wife's, but she recently died. I only need $3,000 more dollars to give her a funeral she deserved. If you feel uncomfortable, I can bring my daughter with me. Quickly, I looked at his contact information and messaged him. It didn't take long before I had a reply and a day that we'd meet. I didn't ask for his daughter to come, since he didn't seem like a murderer. We agreed to meet the next day, and he only lived an hour away. The next day rolled quicker than I expected, and I had to hurry up and leave. I took my dad's car and started my drive to his house where we agreed to meet. When I got there, a chubby man in his early thirties greeted me. Our exchanges weren't anything to put me on edge, but he had an unnerving smile. After our exchanges, I called my dad to come and get his car. 
I got in my new car and drove home. By the time I got back home, I was exhausted. I took a quick shower and fell onto my bed and dozed off soon after. At about 2 a.m., I woke up to the sound of a car door slamming shut. I rubbed the sleep out of my eyes and jerked up. I looked out my window and saw a car in my driveway that wasn't mine or any of my family members. I saw a short, chubby figure getting out of the car with what looked like an axe. I was almost frozen, but I had the courage to get my phone and call 911. I had an eight-year-old sister, so I carried her sleeping body into my room and locked the door. The police didn't live far from my house, so I guess when the man heard the sirens he ran off, because the cops never found anyone. I thought that was the end of it, but I was so wrong. Yesterday evening, I was watching the news, and I saw the police had gotten a deadly serial killer in custody. He was responsible of killing 27 people from Craigslist. It was the same man I had met. I had escaped death. They said his partner in crime, his daughter had gotten away, and was looking for people to kill from Craigslist that her father hadn't killed. My family had just gotten into skiing last year, and instead of buying new equipment, I decided to get some used stuff to start out. Renting equipment was nearly as pricey as the lift ticket. Skiing equipment is just so damn expensive, and had hoped to get into the new season with something that would last my kids for the whole season. I was visiting my office in early January, and had looked up some deals on Craigslist and hoped to find some decent cheap equipment. You see, I travel a great deal for work and occasionally go to my office and since I was in town and heading home for the weekend, I thought it would be a good idea to see what kind of deals I could find locally. Boy, do I regret that decision. I was scrolling through the listings and came across a promising listing complete with pictures and lots of equipment. I replied to the posting via email since there was no number to call. I got a reply within minutes and was given an address to get to the place I made arrangements to meet up with him the next day on my trip home from the office. After work the evening I was heading home, I drove to the address and knocked on the front door. The place was a large older house not very well kept and secluded from the other houses nearby by trees and a rather large hedgerow. The porch was littered with garbage bag full of who knows what and the odor was something that I have never smelled before or would ever want to again. The guy answered the door and was about the scruffiest, shabby dude that never slept in a cardboard box that I have ever seen. We shook hands and he invited me into his home. I'm not gonna lie to you, this dude creeped me out. I should have just made some kind of excuse up and high-tailed it out of there. The guy explained to me that all the skiing stuff was in the basement and began walking away motioning for me to follow him. I reluctantly did keeping my head on a swivel and keeping close to him in the narrow cramped hallway. He led me through the kitchen which was littered with dirty pots and pans as well as trash that looked like it hadn't been taken out in weeks. He stopped at the top of a dark stairway, flipped on the light switch to a naked bulb that lit the landing about six steps down and began descending the short, short flight of steps to the landing, and then turned and began to slowly walk the remainder of the steps into the basement proper. As I followed him, I tried to keep a conversation going, and tried to keep him from hearing my heartbeat, which I thought he could surely hear due to its beating so fast. Watch where you walk down here, there are dangerous things around. He said as he turned his head back towards me. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock, I thought to myself. Like the room full of machetes and chainsaws. I wondered where he kept his mummified mother's corpse sitting in a wheelchair. Yeah, I said, chuckling. You sure do have a little bit of everything in this big old house. I have lots of treasures in here, some more precious than others, he replied with a hint of sarcasm. I'll bet. Is the only reply that I could give my stomach tightening. We got down to the bottom of the lower staircase, and all I could think to myself is this is like the silence of the lands, and this dude is going to tuck his wiener and whip out the lotion at any second. We passed several closed doors, and I tried to guess which one had his skin suit behind it. This place was creepy, like really disturbing. I regretted every step I took behind him. The hairs on the back of my neck began to rise, and that gut-churning feeling grew with every step. I began to sweat, not much, but enough to make me wipe my brow. Hot enough for ya, 
he asked, noting my forehead beating with sweat. Woo-wee, is it warm down here? I exclaimed. Heat rises, that's why you keep it so warm down here, huh? I asked. Gotta keep it hot. I got too many perishables down here. He replied. Come on, it's just right up here. He indicated with a wave of his hand. There at the end of the hall was a large room brightly lit with an impressive array of gently used skiing equipment. I walked over to the neatly arranged rows of boots, poles, and skis and began browsing looking for anything that the kids could fit into. It was really warm down here in the basement, like way too warm. I began to strip off my coat and in while in the middle of it thought that it would not be a great idea my phone, wallet, and car keys were in the pockets. I just unzipped it and hoped that I would be able to find a couple pairs of ski boots that my kids would fit into for the season and anything else we would need to get into the powder. Kids, they grow like weeds, don't they? You really have an impressive collection of high-end ski equipment here. Where did you get it all from? Do you ski up north in the valley? Do you instruct people? I asked. I was thinking that this guy didn't look like he could rub two pennies together. Was all this equipment stolen? Where the hell did he get multiple pairs of $800 ski boots? Those skis are like $1,000, and he has four pairs of them. I looked around and things weren't adding up in my mind. Just as he was about to respond to me, there was a loud banging noise from the back of the room behind a large partition or wall that was obscured from my view. It must be the furnace. It makes all kinds of noises when it kicks on. The guy said, I chuckled nervously and nodded and went back to trying to come up with an excuse to just tell the guy that nothing looked that it would be the right size and boogie the F out of there. I heard another louder bang from the same direction. You should really take a look at that it doesn't sound too good. Maybe I should just come back later. I said trying to keep my mind from entertaining all the various ways that he would dissect my corpse. Yeah, give me just a minute, I'll be right back. He said and stalked towards the sound, his fists balling up. Don't go anywhere. The inflection on the word anywhere was, let's be honest, ominous to say the least. Curiosity almost killed the cat in this situation. I crept closer to the partition, cat-like in my stealth, strained my ears and heard the guy whispering in a low angry tone to something and a few loud sharp thuds on something metallic. The guy came around the corner just as I turned around to sneak back to the ski equipment. Were you spying on me? He asked with venom dripping in his voice. No, not at all. I was just looking to see if I could lend you a hand. Then you came back around the corner. I blurted out not thinking of anything better to say. So I don't believe you. You were spying on me. What did you hear? What did you see? He roared. It's nothing. I... I didn't hear any of the words that you were whispering to your furnace so angrily, I said and continued. Hey, old furnaces are a bitch and need some tough love sometimes. I stammered, holding my hand up and shrugging my shoulders. At this point, I was slowly backing away from the guy and he kept advancing. I walked backwards into the piles of skis and ski poles. Just as I bumped into them, I saw a flash of silver in the guy's right hand and as I focused on it, I saw a wicked hooked blade that looked like something out of a nightmare. I held my left hand out in front of me and felt around behind my back for something, anything to use as a weapon. The guy took a step towards me, brandishing the knife with evil intent. My hand clamped around the grip of a pretty sturdy ski pole, and I lunged towards him swinging it in a brutal arc, hoping to brain the guy and run like hell. The guy stepped back about half a step as to avoid the swing. Instead of the pole whacking him in the side of the head, the knurled tip of the pole raked a deep trench across his face from left to right from his left cheek to his right eyebrow. He howled in pain and grabbed his face as the blood started to flow. I could clearly see that this was a pretty good cut across his face. I may have even damaged his left eye. I could see the cartilage of his nose through the wide and deep wound. You bastard. It'll make you wish that you have never been born, the crazed man screamed. I'll show you the real meaning of pain, he continued. Like this, yelled right back at him. I swung the pole in an upward trajectory into his crotch, and as he doubled over as the pole destroyed his manhood, I grabbed him by the back of the head and rammed my knee into his face. Bruce Lee would have been proud of me on that one and ran like the devil himself was chasing me, up the stairs and through the rest of the house. 
I burst through the front door, ran for my car and dialing 911 as my feet slapped the concrete sidewalk. The police showed up within a few minutes, blue and red lights strobing in the early evening. He's in there in the basement, I heard him pretty badly, but I'm not sure if he's down for the count or still kicking. I explained to the two burly officers that came running up to me. We will take it from here. The closest officer told me and drew his weapon from his holster. Just stay back and don't leave the area, he instructed. I walked over to my car and stood there shivering in the cold twilight, my heart still racing like a thoroughbred. Two more cruisers showed up screeching to a halt, lights ablazing and sirens wailing. I pointed to the house excitedly and gave them a thumbs up. About 15 minutes later, a total of six officers were in the house, and after about another five, the front door swung violently open and three officers were busy dragging the psycho out in handcuffs. As he passed me, the guy looked at me, and if looks could kill, I would have been dead on the spot. His face was a mess of blood and torn skin. Looks like the cops gave him the once-over down there as well. You wouldn't believe what we found down there. The first officer that I spoke to said to me, he had a woman in a big cage right next to the furnace all drugged up or something she was semi-conscious when we got to her. The guy was in the process of opening her cage, I assumed to kill her, when we finally found him. He continued, So you really did a number on this guy, didn't you? He asked. I was just trying to get the hell out of there. I did what I had to. I answered, so You did a good thing. That woman will be in your debt, I'm sure. The officer said, I didn't know that she was there or else I would have tried to help her. I explained, No worries, we have an ambulance on the way and we'll take good care of her. He replied, I gave my statement later that evening and finished my drive home with a promise that I would testify at his trial. It was regional news by the time I got home. It was on all the news channels. A day or so later, the investigation revealed that he also had a torture-echoing chamber in a nearly hidden locked room with enough of evidence of multiple homicides to put him in the electric chair. The police also found the bodies of twelve more unfortunate souls in the crawlspace under the front porch further cementing his guilt. I vowed to myself, then and there as I watched the anchor retell the gruesome story, that was the last time I would ever use Craigslist. obligatory not me but my girlfriend. Girlfriend's lease is up and is looking for a room to rent for the remainder of college, so being a student turned to Craigslist. She finds a great looking house in a brilliant location, about 30 minutes from the university, and a two minute walk from Main Street of a lovely little town. Rent's kinda cheap too. The house is a three bedroom, two bathroom place, and there is two guys living there. One was 24 and the other was 35 or close, can't remember exact age, who both work together. Girlfriend goes for a visit and meets said guys, thinks they're pretty decent but the older one is a little odd. She decided to move in. All goes well for a couple months, she gets to know the guys better and turns out older guy has been homeless before and had a pretty rough start to life, but now he's firmly on his feet. She chalks his weirdness up to that. I come for a quick visit and meet these guys myself. Younger one is great, very talkative and generally a nice guy. Older one is very quiet and keeps to his room a lot. I thought he was pretty weird too. I know you're waiting for a horror story, so here it comes. About a month or so after my visit, I get a phone call from my girlfriend who is in tears. She said that the police have raided their house with a warrant for CP. The police has seized everybody's electronics, laptops, tablets, etc. Everyone in the house is like WTF. Obviously my girlfriend was absolutely terrified. She knew it wasn't her and I think the police did too. She managed to get her stuff back pretty quickly after a few trips to the station. Me and her both guessed that it must have been older guy. Turns out it was older guy. One day he packed up a backpack of stuff and just left the house left his keys on the table never to return. We suspect he was basically running away. He left all of his other stuff in his room. Remember I said the guys worked together? Younger guy told us a few days after older guy had run off. That older guy went into the office and basically admitted it was him, and that he's been doing it for a while, and that he's going to turn himself in. 
Naturally, he got fired on the spot. Obviously, he didn't turn himself in and has since vanished. I used to sell computers on Craigslist from a home office. I never had a problem with people in person, but I had a phone call once that was creepy. This guy calls up and asks about a laptop I had for sale, and after some typical questions he asks, Can I get prawn on it? I said, sure, there are lots of sites. But can I get? And he begins naming off genres of prawn. I got annoyed and I said that he could. This went on for two more rounds before I said, Enough is enough, the laptop wasn't for sale anymore, and I hung up. Two minutes later, the same call comes in and I ignore it. The guy proceeds to leave a minute-long message about how I'm not being fair, and I was making him angry. He never called again. This story contains gore and mild language. I just graduated college a month ago and decided to move into a house with my four friends, whom I will call Edward, Don, Nate, and Mason. I've known them since a very early age. Moving on with the story, this house isn't in a good neighborhood. It's a small five-room, one-story house and has a little backyard we plan to use for parties and cookouts. The house was built in the 50s and was completely empty when we bought it. One of the first things we almost got was a couch. We were sitting on the floor of Mason's bedroom looking on our only computer, an old 2007 MacBook he received when his parents passed away in a car accident. Scrolling through the furniture section of Craigslist, we spotted a couch. The couch? It was $20 mint condition, vintage leather, and everything you could wish for in the perfect couch. We sent the owner a request to his email, mikepowell at yahoo.com. Nothing strange. He sent us his address, and we were off the next day. Edward looked up his address on Google Maps. It was 10 miles away from us in an apartment condo downtown. Our Ford F-150 was out of gas, so we rode in Don's Prius. During the first half of our drive, our car ran low on fuel, so we went to the nearest station, a sketchy Exxon building. But every gas station looks kind of ghetto, right? Mason and I were digging some honey buns and went into the store while Nate, Don, and Edward were doing whatever. I was casually strolling toward the building when I noticed something strange, the lights were off. How could a gas station be closed at 12 noon? Being the rambunctious college kids that we are, me and Mason bust in. My nose and eyes crippled and stung as the most putrid scent anyone could sense slammed into my body. I let out a cry and fell to the floor, a rather soft one. Find the light switch. Find it now, blasts out of my mouth. I hear a faint click and light engulfs the room. As soon as my eyes adjust to the light, I stop. It's like that feeling when you power off your phone and the screen turns blank, lifeless, and empty. It takes me a while to process my surroundings. There are about six dead bodies in all forms missing limbs, bones, teeth, or eyes. The soft body I fell on wasn't the floor. I look at where my hands touch the body. A tooth was stuck in my wrist and an unpleasant dark red blanket of blood stretched over my hands. Mason and I busted through the door and ran toward the rest of the group. We explained what happened, hopped in the car, and sped off. I looked back one more time at the gas station. I saw one eye peering through one of the window blinds. I closely observed and noticed the area of the blind that was opened is enough to fit two eyes. When we arrived at the apartment, I wiped off my bloody arms in a stream across the road. The apartment was five stories high. Mike's room was room hash 327 on floor 2. My group opened the doors and set foot in the lobby. No one was there. We located Mike's room and knocked on the door. Hello, we hear. It must be Mike. Yes, we are looking for Mike Powell. He is selling a couch on Craigslist. There is no reply. I notice a peephole and, due to me only being 5 FT, Three basically short for an American adult, if you're foreign, I stand on the tips of my toes and look through. Nothing but a bed and... Heads. Heads everywhere, lined up against the wall. Some still had their spines hanging out of their necks. Shing. The sound echoes through the hall, piercing through my ears. Someone pulled out a knife. I turn around to see Mike. His lower jaw is completely missing, and he has a hole through his chest, exposing his ribcage and lungs. 
Surprise, he says, as his one eye turned toward Edward. He stabbed straight through his forehead. Me and the rest of the gang managed to safely get home. We never got the couch. A few months ago, my landlord said we had to leave the house because he wanted to sell it and gave us a few weeks' notice. At that time, I lived with four housemates and was really close to three of them. I had been living in that house for around three years as a tenant. I don't know if the owner had money problems or not, but one day he came and gave us all letters saying we had to leave. So I went to stay with my parents for a few weeks while I looked for a temporary place to live. It meant I needed to find somewhere affordable and close to my work with a similar budget. At that time I had a part-time job at Starbucks and was interning at a company. It was a stressful time and I didn't have much free time. This situation was just another challenge in my life, but I handled it quite well as my parents were there to support me. Sadly, I don't talk to those three old friends anymore and I kind of miss them. Now, after moving in with my parents, I realized I wish I had kept in touch with my old housemates. Let me tell you about my new situation. The house I used to live in was only a five-minute drive from my workplace, and my parents' house was a 25-minute drive away, so it messed up my daily schedule, and a few times I got to work late. I understand I needed to be more organized, but I was only 19. I had trouble getting up on time and felt tired. Most teenagers go through a phase like that, and mine just happened a bit later. The truth was I had to find a new place quickly because this situation wasn't working. Every day, going from my parents' house to work, I ended up being either 20 minutes late or at least 5 or 10 minutes behind. My boss was very strict, and he used to give me angry looks even if I was just one minute late. It became too much, and during one shift, he called me aside to talk. Even though my boss and I had a good relationship, he told me that being late so often had to stop. He said it was causing problems for the company, and if it happened again, he might have to let me go. That was a wake-up call for me, and I knew I had to make a change. So that evening, I went on Craigslist when I returned home to my parents' house after my shift. I found plenty of rooms available for rent, and they were all within my budget. The main thing I needed was a place close to my workplace. Many were near the city, which was farther than my parents' house, so that wouldn't work. However, I found a couple of options that seemed promising. One of the places I considered was literally across the road from my workplace. I hesitated for a moment, thinking it might be too close, but in the end, I didn't really mind. Now, I had no excuse for being late to work because it was just a short walk away. It was that simple. I got in touch with the person who posted the room rental ad, and it turned out they were from a company working for the landlord. They told me I could either visit the place or sign the contract right away, based on the pictures. I didn't feel the need to visit in person. Usually, when landlords have companies representing them, it's trustworthy. It turned out this guy was indeed trustworthy, and the whole place was very clean. I signed the contract and moved in three days later. They gave me a quick tour before I settled into my new room. This time, I only had two other people sharing the house with me. There was also a spare bedroom mentioned in the ad that no one had taken yet. One of my housemates seemed to be a girl around my age, and the other was a guy who looked like he was about 50, maybe even 60 years old. At first, the older guy gave me some really weird vibes. He seemed very awkward, socially speaking. The girl didn't say much. She just looked at me and waved briefly. She gave off a kind of goofy vibe, like maybe she's into video games or something. Neither of them seemed very confident, but that was okay with me. The last thing I wanted was an overly confident, loud, and crazy housemate. Believe me, I've had those before. I moved in and unpacked my stuff, but I was really surprised when I saw the kitchen because it was super clean. In my last place, there were always dirty dishes lying around in the kitchen, so this was a big change. It looked like no one had even used it before. I don't know if the agency or company told them to clean up before I arrived, maybe to make the house look better. Whatever they did, it worked. My room was also incredibly clean, and it seemed like they had put in a new mattress and bedding. Everything was spotless, and the carpet smelled like it had just come out of the factory. 
when I met my housemates and got a tour of the house, something surprised me. I noticed that every room in the house had a phone, not a mobile phone, but one of those old-fashioned landline phones with wires. I thought it was strange and unusual that every room had one. It didn't seem to have a clear reason. In my room, there was a phone on a little stand to the left of my bed, with a wire going through the wall. I asked the lady about it, and she said they all worked. She explained that there was a phone in every room, and you could call anyone you wanted to. It didn't really make sense to me, so I didn't ask any more questions about it. Well, the first night went smoothly. I cooked some food for myself and kept to myself. I had work the next morning, so I went to bed early around 9.30. On the other end, my two housemates were really quiet all night. There was just one noise, and if I remember correctly, it was the girl next door coughing. But the second night is when things started to get a bit strange. You see, there was a home phone in my room, and I hadn't used it or even touched it, to be honest, as I was still getting used to the place. I went to work the next morning, and everything was fine. The whole day went well, and I came back home but I still hadn't really talked to my housemates, which made things a bit awkward because I knew I'd have to at some point. Whether it was bumping into them in the hallway or being in the kitchen with them, it was bound to happen. Well, I ended up meeting the guy in a really awkward way. It was around 8 p.m. on the second night, and I was getting ready for bed. I was just on my phone, lying in bed. For me, an early night is around 9 to 9.30 because I have to leave for work at 5 or 5.30. Then the home phone in my room, the one with the cord, started ringing. Feeling confused and like anyone else, I just said a simple hello. But what I heard on the other end was nothing, absolutely nothing. It was like hearing darkness. Not a sound, no static, no breathing, no talking, which really gave me an eerie feeling. I put the phone down and hung up. Then went back to my bed and thought maybe it was just someone dialing the wrong number or one of those annoying calls trying to sell me stuff. I was on my phone for about 20 more minutes when the same phone rang again. I started to think I should unplug this phone. If it kept ringing all night, it would definitely wake up my two roommates next door. I answered the phone again and once more the same eerie silence. Nobody answered and there was no sound, just silence. At this point, I was getting pretty frustrated, but I realized I couldn't disconnect the phone because it was connected through a wire in the wall. It seemed like someone had drilled a hole just big enough for the wire to pass through. Unless I cut the wire, which would be illegal, it meant I couldn't stop the phone from ringing. The phone stayed silent for the next three hours, and I managed to get about two and a half hours of sleep. But then it started ringing again at midnight. This time, I had had enough. I walked over to the phone, picked it up, and said, Hello, who is this? This isn't funny. Please, can you stop calling? This time, I heard heavy breathing on the other end, like someone was breathing heavily or was excited. This made me feel really uncomfortable, so I said, Who is this? Who are you? Why are you calling me? But they just kept breathing heavily and didn't answer. It was so creepy that I hung up without saying anything. Only a minute later, the phone rang again. I answered and started shouting into the phone, What do you want? Please stop calling me. But all I heard was more heavy breathing, just like before. The breathing was deep, slow, and it sounded like a man. I didn't know what to do except maybe cut the wire, but I was worried about getting in trouble for that. I decided to ignore the phone and take a deep breath to relax. I thought that if I didn't answer, maybe they would stop calling eventually. So that's what I did for the next hour. They kept calling almost every single minute. I couldn't help but wonder what was going on here. Around one o'clock in the morning, I heard a knock on my door. I thought they had been patient since the phone had been ringing for over an hour by then. It seemed like they were finally coming to talk to me. I quickly put on my slippers and threw on a hoodie to look a bit more presentable. I was ready to apologize and try to be as nice as possible. When I opened the door, I saw my 50-year-old housemate. He had taken the landline phone from his room and dragged the wires all the way across the hallway. He was holding the phone to his ear and breathing heavily into it. That's when I let out a scream so loud that I couldn't even hear anything else for the next few minutes. My knees were trembling and I tried to get back to my room, but it was really hard. 
When I finally got back to my room, I almost fell down. I quickly slammed the door and locked it. I didn't know what to do next. I rushed to my bed where my mobile phone was lying next to it. I quickly picked up the phone and called 911. Later, it turned out that my housemate had been the one calling me and making those creepy breathing sounds for the past three hours. The police came and took both of us for questioning. I explained my side of the story, but he didn't explain anything. According to the police, he just sat in his room in silence. He wouldn't talk, he just kept breathing heavily. It gave me the creeps. So that night, I moved back in with my parents. The police took us in around 4 in the morning after I gave them some statements about what had happened. They were really worried that it could have turned into something more serious, so they detained both of us. Well, after that, I went back to live with my parents, and even now, a whole year later, I still live with them. That night was really traumatic for me, and I have no idea what was wrong with that guy. I don't know if he just wanted to be friends, had a mental illness, or if he was genuinely creepy and planning something else. Had a spare set of rare factory wheels for my Mazda and hadn't touched them in over a year. Drove an hour to meet someone halfway at a well-lit Walmart after numerous confirmations that his Mazda had the same bolt pattern and a close enough offset that they would fit. Idiot shows up in a Honda without even the right number of lugs and starts saying that they aren't the same wheels from the ad. Then he says they may fit his other Honda that's at his house, half a mile down the road. I told him thank you for wasting my time and drove away as he called and texted me that he was going to follow me and get those wheels. I sold a set of chef's knife with a knife block. The guy asked me to hold it for him until the weekend. Then he flaked on the first time we set to meet up. He later flaked on the second meet up. Each time I had spoken to him, he sounded like he had some sort of mental disability or was not all there socially. Normally, this wouldn't really bug me, but since these were huge chef knives I was going to be selling to him, I thought I should be careful. I ended up telling him that I left the knives by the mailbox and to leave the money in the mail. I figured if he wanted to just steal the knives, that was fine. As long as he didn't have the knives anywhere near me, Fortunately, the knives were gone after a short time with money in the mail, and I never heard from him again. Let's throw away for some very obvious reasons. I'm a straight guy, but I get off on some stuff most would consider gay. Nothing too crazy, just some dildo riding and panty wearing, if that can be considered tame. Anyway, I chucked an ad up on Craigie's looking to be blown by a guy, so I could finally ditch the curiosity that has always lingered in the back of my head. Met this one guy who was early 50s who seemed to be really nice, kinda like a loving dad type of nice. Cue pics back and forth, and I felt like meeting up. So we decide on a day, and he gets a hotel room. Now I don't drive, so I had to take a bus, train, and tram just to get close to where this hotel was. Left home at 9 p.m., took the bus and train, and arrived in the city at around 10 p.m. There was never any real sense of communication with this guy, very sporadic messages lacking detail of any sort. I couldn't get a specific address for the hotel, so he kind of just directed me around via landmarks, e.g. Go to this place on the corner of blah blah, now go to such and such. Eventually I get to the Scottam Hotel at 10.30 p.m., and I'm waiting outside in the cold, wet rain for a reply of some sort from this dude. It wasn't until around 11.30 p.m. that he tells me to go inside like I'm staying at the place and head up to room blah blah. I was pissed that I waited that long but I held my tongue cause it might be a fun night. Anyway I get up to the room and knock. The doors opens and it's him. Stark bloody naked. I was a bit taken aback but whatever I came here for a reason. The first thing I noticed when I walked in was the dildo lube bottle and massive bottle of baby oil on the nightstand. This was the first red flag for me, but I thought, okay, maybe that's for him because I sure ain't gonna let him F me with anything. So I take my backpack off and slump into an armchair, all the while this horny bugger is yanking his dick not one meter away from me. And now the part where I get scared. Knock knock. Someone was knocking on the door. 
So this guy walks over and opens the door and in walks this other cunt with an ungodly amount of tattoos. Really struck me as the type to be a bloody druggo. I'm talking knuckles, sleeves, and facial tats. Anyway, I'm trying my hardest not to look like I'm seething, and we exchange pleasantries. Kid in way over his head, this is Mr. Drogo. Mr. Drogo, kid in way over his head. Mr. Drogo goes and has a shower, and I'm alone with this horny guy still yanking himself. I tell him, yo, who is that guy? You said it was gone be me and you, that's it. He then proceeds to tell me he invited two other guys, but it's okay because they're subs and they'll do what we tell them to. He then proceeded to grab my crotch and tell me that he'd take care of me. Now fellas, here's a reason to wank every day. I was so clouded by the fact that I hadn't orgasmed in five days and some guy had touched my dick, that I decided to sit back down and see how it played out. Sister Curve Drugo finishes his shower and comes out just in some jocks. He lies on the bed and horny bugger and him start having a lovely chat. Meanwhile, I'm on my phone thinking, why the F did I agree to come here? Before I even finish that thought process, I hear a familiar sound someone is using a lighter. I turn to my left and I see Mr. Drogo doing what I completely expected Mr. Drogo to do. He's smocking shards. So that's red flag number two. Horny bugger said, I didn't know you were going to do that, mate. To which Mr. Drugo replies, Oh, it's okay, I only do a little bit when I'm on leave from the service. Our troops are on shards, the people that will protect our soil should we be in a time of war. However, I told my dick to STFU and gained lucidity, at which point I told horny bugger I wasn't comfortable and that I was going to leave, so I left. Now that I look back, I feel it was extremely lucky that I was able to leave that hotel room without any resistance from either of those two guys. To top it all off, the trains were delayed and I had to wait until 1 a.m. for the 12.13 a.m. train. Walking back home after that felt like the longest two-kilometer walk of my life and lying in bed after that was horrible. Asking myself over and over, am I really soliciting strange men for sexual favors? Is this who I am? Am I really doing this? Hopefully this will serve as a lesson to some, not as a deterrent, but as a story to take in and learn from. It all started with a Craigslist ad. I had just moved into a new apartment and being the broke post-grad that I am, I had pretty much nothing to my name except a few boxes of stuff from my parents' house and a busted up box spring mattress. At that point most days I was sitting cross-legged on the floor in the living room, eating off paper plates while binging Netflix from my laptop for hours at a time. Clearly, this was no way to live and so I decided to log on to my neighbor's unprotected Wi-Fi network and hunt for some furniture, so I could at least binge Netflix from the comfort of a couch and stop eating on the floor like a savage. And so I hopped onto the free section of Craigslist and began searching for a couch. If you ever searched for a couch on Craigslist, it's not great. Half the couches on there are held together with duct tape, and the other half are covered in stains of dubious origin. I may be broke as hell, but I'm not that broke. I have standards. I had to have been scrolling for well over an hour, and was probably already a week into the backlogs. I was going to quit, but decided to give the page a refresh before calling it a day. And the moment I refreshed, it caught my eye. The ad was right at the top, not even a minute old, listed as Brand new couch, never used free for pickup. Brand new sounded pretty good to me, so I went ahead and opened it. The couch was in perfect condition. Almost suspiciously perfect, but there were no stains, no lumps, no broken legs. I wasn't one to look a gift horse in the mouth, so I typed out a quick response that I'd be willing to take it off their hands, and then prayed that no one had beaten me to the punch. I got a response less than five minutes later. So yeah, the couch is all yours if you can come by to pick it up today. I'm available until 8, so be sure to get out here by then. You might want to leave soon. I was slightly confused by that last part until I saw the address. This place was way out in the boonies. Way far. Nestled in the part of the country reserved for mountain men and hillbillies. I was hesitant. It was a long drive. To the back country where no one can hear you scream. 
But as I sat there in my sparse living room on the bare floor, I realized that I really needed that couch, and it was probably safe. People almost always walk away from Craigslist deals alive. Usually, it was a stupid thing to do, but I did it anyways. I typed out another quick reply that I'd be heading out right away and thanked them for the couch. Then I grabbed my keys and bolted out the door and hopped in my truck. I plugged the address into Google Maps and was on my way. As I drove down the interstate, I began to appreciate just how far I was going to get one piece of furniture. The cityscape soon gave way to suburban housing developments, and those developments soon gave way to the vast brush of the middle of nowhere. I never really understood why people would want to be so far removed from society, but to each their own, I guess. I had been driving through mountains and valleys for the better part of an hour when Google Maps finally spoke up. In 500 feet, take exit 23 for Arbor Road. I sighed in relief. I was getting closer. As I got off the freeway, Google chimed in again. Take the next ride on Arbor Road. I made my way deeper and deeper into the countryside. Giant oaks leaned over stretches of road and every so often a squirrel would tempt fate and dash across the road in front of me. It was deserted. I don't think I saw another car since I had gotten off the freeway. In 200 feet, take the next left onto Gable Lane. I jumped a little when Google broke the silence, but quickly regained my senses and slowed down to take the left. Turn left onto Gable Lane. But I couldn't see it. There didn't seem to be any road at all, just woods and brush. I stopped in the middle of the road. I could see the path on the map. There should be a road. I pulled my car forward slowly, searching for the street that should be there. And then I saw it. Just barely. It's like the woods was trying to hide it. It was almost completely overgrown on the sides. Brush piled high on both sides, spilling out onto the asphalt. The sign was literally being swallowed up by a tree. The words Able Land poked out from beneath the bark. I'll be honest, I nearly turned around right there. This is the part of the horror movie where you yell at the idiot college kids to turn around and spend spring break in Cabo like everyone else. But I had been driving for forever and turning around then would have meant wasting the afternoon and about a half tank of gas. I'm frugal if a little stupid, so I took the left and pushed past the overgrown brush onto Gable Lane. From there, it wasn't as spooky as you'd think from the creepy entrance. Gable Lane opened up once again into a proper road, and I was on my way once more. And then ten minutes later, the road stopped. Or rather, the asphalt did. Big clouds of dust filled the air as my truck hit a dirt road. I did a quick check of my map to be sure I hadn't taken a wrong turn. But the app confirmed I was going in the right direction. I drove down the dirt road for a good five minutes when Google Maps chimed in again. In half a mile, take a right at the gnarled oak tree. That was odd. Since when did Google Maps start giving directions like a clerk at a liquor store? Does Google Maps even use landmarks in their directions? But sure enough, a half mile down the road, a huge oak tree stood old and twisted, half of its leaves missing and at its base was another dirt road, much less traveled, nearly overrun with tall grass. I took the turn and continued down the road. The next fifteen minutes was a rabbit trail of different roads and landmarks that took me deeper and deeper into the woods. Let's turn left at the pile of rocks. Let's turn left at the broken down tractor. Let's turn right into the grove of trees. I had nearly reached my breaking point, which I admit, I probably should have reached far sooner when the road in front of me stopped dead. There was no asphalt, no dirt, just a wall of trees and bushes. I couldn't drive any farther. I was pissed. Google had screwed up. It took me on a wild goose chase through the middle of nowhere, likely way far away from my destination, and now some other lucky bastard was going to get my free couch. Take the wooden footpath ahead for 100 yards. I snapped out of my anger. What did it just say? I looked at my phone. The instructions had turned from car directions to walking directions, the little walking man icon now highlighted on the screen. I looked up and through the glare on my windshield I could see it. Straight ahead there was a small break in the bushes behind which I could see a series of wooden logs half buried in the dirt, forming a path through the trees. Again, had I more sense, I would have turned back then. 
But I'm nothing if not persistent, so instead I climbed out of my truck, locked it, and headed through the trees and down the path. The path wound up and down the hillside, through the trees, around prickly bushes, and soon my truck was out of sight. It started to occur to me that even if I found the house and got the couch, I was going to have to lug it all the way back to the truck. That was going to be a gigantic pain in the ass. I could only hope the couch giver would lend me a hand. I was pretty far down the path when Google spoke again. After the bend, take a left along the riverbank. I could hear the water before I saw it. As I rounded the bend, a large, rushing river came into view. I didn't look deep, but it didn't look exactly safe to cross. I was glad Google wasn't asking me to ford it. I did as instructed and took a left alongside the river. Google chimed in almost immediately. In 200 feet, take the fallen tree over the river, of course. Of course I was going to have to cross the damn river. It wasn't long before I saw the tree. It was huge and long dead, devoid of any leaves and dry as a bone. It lay across the river, resting on either side of the bank. The river ran below it, a bit calmer than when I first saw it, but I still wasn't keen on falling in. Take the fallen tree over the river. I took a deep breath, scrambled over the roots and hoisted myself up onto the dead tree. Why the hell not? I'd come this far. Even if there was no couch at the end of this, I'd at least have a fun story to tell. It was a slightly scary trip across the dead tree. I was certain at some point my foot would break through a rotten patch, and I'd turn my ankle or go sprawling into the water below. But aside from a few worrying creaks and cracks, I got to the other end with no problem. Google had started talking again before my feet even touched the ground on the other side. Take the path in the thicket ahead for 400 yards. All right, Google, you're the boss. I proceeded through the thicket ahead, almost enjoying myself at that point. I was bushwhacking like some old school adventurer, except the hidden treasure I was seeking was a sofa instead of the holy grail. Along the way, Google kept feeding me instructions. Take a right around the large boulder. Take the embankment upward to your left. Keep straight past the hornet's nest. In fifty feet, take a right past the rotten stump. Looking back, the directions were impossible. How the hell would Google know that a hornet's nest would be on that tree? There's no way they were sending people down here to plot directions to some redneck's house in the butt crack of nowhere. But I was tired and stubborn, and in the moment it barely registered. I know what you're thinking. I am not a smart man. You're not wrong. I had just finished wading through a sea of bushes when I came into what I can only describe as a hollow. I don't know if that's the right word, but that's what I'm calling it. The forest cleared out in nearly a perfect circle, maybe forty feet in every direction. The branches of the ancient trees joined together above me, shutting out the sun, casting the entire area in shadow. And in the middle of the hollow was a large, stony outcropping, jutting out of the ground like a broken molar. And in the middle of that outcropping was an opening. I stepped out into the hollow and could feel the temperature drop. I stopped dead. This wasn't right. I nearly jumped when Google spoke up. Enter the cave. And that was that it. I was done. Like hell, I was going into some creepy cave in the woods for a damned couch. I'll put up with a good amount of nonsense, but I have my limits. I turned to leave, hoping I could get back to my car and the main road before the sun went down. Google piped up again. Enter the cave. Yeah, no thanks. I stepped towards the exit of the hollow and hadn't even gone two steps before it interjected once more. The way back is closed. Enter the cave. What do you mean? The way back is closed, I shouted at my phone. I'm going back to my truck. If you do not know how to get back, you will get lost. I stopped dead and chills went down my spine. I stared at my phone for a few seconds before raising it up to my mouth. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I was on the verge of pissing my pants. I could feel myself begin to shake. I clenched my fists, took a few deep breaths before the panic could overtake me. I steeled myself and shouted back at my phone. I'm not going into that friggin' cave. I'm going back to the truck. You do not know the way back. And then the fear gave way to anger. I was fully prepared to get into an argument with my phone right then, and there when I realized it was right. Google must have given me twenty different directions since I left my car, and they were all basically down unmarked paths. 
There was no way I could find my way back without Google and Google was not going to help me. If I tried to find my way, I'd be stuck in deliverance country in the middle of the night alone. I considered phoning for help, but my reception was dead. The bar is replaced with a big fat circle with a slash through it. Enter the cave. I clenched my jaw. I didn't have much of a choice. I was basically hosed no matter what I chose to do. I turned around looking into the mouth of the cave. It was pitch black, a gaping maw in the middle of the rock. And that's where I had to go. I approached it, slowly, carefully, as if the entrance were a wild animal waiting to swallow me whole. As I reached the entrance I could smell the fetid aroma of damp, dead leaves. The air around the entrance was even colder than the air at the beginning of the hollow. The chilling air wrapped around my chest, almost as if it meant to grab me and drag me into the depths. I looked down at the shining light of my phone screen. Google spoke once more. Enter the cave. I took a deep, shuddering breath, closed my eyes, and with all the courage I could muster, I stepped into the cave. It's part 2. The moment I stepped into the cave, it was like all light blinked out of existence. It was darker than dark, completely pitch black. I turned my phone around, holding it in front of me like a priest with a crucifix, trying to banish the darkness away. It didn't work, I still couldn't see a thing. Google Maps spoke up. Continue forward for 150 feet, then turn right. I couldn't stop from chuckling to myself. A fat lot of good directions were when I couldn't see the hands in front of my face. I stumbled forward a few steps before the realization struck me. My phone had a flashlight app. I turned my phone back around and fumbled through my home screen until I found the app. I tapped it and after a few seconds a nice strong beam of light from the back mounted lead cut through the darkness and into the cave in front of me. Honestly the cave wasn't terribly impressive. Pretty darn average as far as I could tell. The floor was dirt, littered with dead leaves and rocks. Vines hung from the ceiling and the walls were solid stone. I reached out a hand and touched the walls. I withdrew it quickly. It was ice cold. I shivered. What the hell was I doing here? Continue forward for 150 feet, then turn right. Yeah, yeah, I replied, holding the phone back in front of me and making my way into the cave. The next stretch of time was basically uneventful. I took the next right I saw and from then on it was mostly just a series of lefts and rights through the rocky, winding passages. If anything was remarkable, it was how deep the tunnels seemed to go. I had been walking for maybe 15 minutes. That may seem like a short amount of time, but you can cover a lot of distance, even just walking. This cave system was vast, and I was only covering a short section of it. After a while, Google's voice broke through the silence. In 20 feet, take the passage on the left. Whatever you say, Google. I moved steadily forward, switching from looking ahead to checking the map on the screen. Soon I came to the turn. Take the passage on the left. I shined the flashlight to my left. A deep fissure ran from the ceiling to the floor of the cave. It was wide, but not exactly human-friendly. I can't go through there, I scoffed. It's way too small. I turned the flashlight back to the wide open passage in front of me. Why can't I just go this way? They wait for you down that path. Do not go there. Well, that was creepy. I felt an involuntary shudder run down my spine. Who's waiting for me down there, I asked. Take the passage on the left. Okay, fine, be a cryptic asshole. Honestly, I was tempted to just say screw it and go down the broad path anyways. For all I knew, that was the way out and Google Maps was just digging me farther and farther into a dead end. I shined the light down the path once more. It would be easier. But then again. The more I looked down the broad passageway, the more something felt off. I couldn't place it. But you know that feeling you get, where your whole body just seems to be screaming at you that something's not right. Like your subconscious is reading the situation way more clearly than you are, and it's telling you to stay the hell away. Yeah, I was beginning to get that in spades. It wasn't until a few days later, looking back, that I realized what was wrong. The path was completely dark about ten feet ahead of me. I don't mean dark like the rest of the cave. I mean completely black. My flashlight didn't illuminate anything ten feet down the path. Not the walls, not the floor, nothing. It's like the darkness just swallowed the light, 
kept it from getting any farther. Who knows what would have happened if I had gone down that path even just a short distance. I still get the shivers just thinking about it. I turn the flashlight back towards the fissure inside. I guess I was doing this. I steeled myself and then phone first began to squeeze myself through the giant crack in the wall. Now, I'm not super hefty, but I'm not exactly a stick either. It was a tight squeeze. At several points I had to breathe out a bit so I could fit through the hard, gritty hole in the wall. Luckily, it only took me a few moments to get through. The crack itself was only a couple feet deep and soon I was out on the other side. I turned the flashlight into the area in front of me. It was bigger than I was expecting. I figured I'd just end up in more tunnels, but this was an entire chamber maybe 30 feet high, 25 feet wide. Along the wall, broad outcroppings of rock stuck out at odd angles, creating lopsided shelves all the way to the ceiling. To climb to the top. What? I asked. To climb to the top. I shined my light up the wall, past the rocky shelves and to the ceiling. I took me a few seconds, but then I saw it. It was a long, broad crack where the ceiling met the wall. It was even smaller than the fissure in the tunnel. You're kidding me, I breathed. But at that point I was starting to get over the stupid crap Google was asking me to do. Arguing with it wasn't helpful and honestly, giving up and going back seemed less and less likely as an option. But I walked over to the far wall and lugged my tired self up onto the first rocky shelf. I wasn't exactly thrilled to be climbing up a rock wall. I'm not in great shape. I went to a climbing gym once, tried bouldering. I fell and landed weird, nearly tore my ankle. So clinging to the side of the cave wall wasn't my idea of a good time. But I kept at it. Shelf after rocky shelf, I made my way up the wall. Some shelves were really broad, enough for me to lie on my back and catch my breath for a minute. Some were butt-clenchingly narrow, requiring me to lean flat against the wall and hope to God I didn't lean back an inch too far. Whenever I had solid enough ground, I'd turn my phone around and shine it down to the floor below. That wasn't a particularly good idea. Thirty feet always looks much higher when you're at the top of it than when you're at the bottom. But I did it anyways, I guess I'm just curious like that. After what seemed like forever, I hauled myself up onto the last shelf and rolled over onto my back, my breathing ragged. I had done it. I had climbed to the top. I was contemplating just lying there and napping for a bit when my damn phone spoke up again. To continue forward for thirty yards. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath, trying to will away the annoyance. I gave myself a minute and rolled over, shined my flashlight at the space between the wall and the ceiling. My heart stopped. It was a long, deep gash in the wall, maybe fifteen feet wide, but only a little over a foot tall. It made the fissure in the tunnel look like a thoroughfare. Oh God, I whispered to myself. Oh God, oh God, oh God. I could feel myself begin to panic, but I clenched my eyes shut and took a few calming breaths. I couldn't be freaking out right now, not if I was going to wedge myself into a rocky crevice deep underground. After a few moments of silently psyching myself up, I rolled onto my belly, held my phone out in front of me and soldier crawled into the crack in the wall. I should tell you, I'm not claustrophobic. Not in the least. I've found myself in all sorts of tight spaces in life. Closets, crowded subway cars, a car trunk at one point. Tight spaces have never fazed me. But in that moment, crammed literally between a rock and a hard place, you get claustrophobic really fast. As I made my way slowly, inch by inch, dragging my belly over the rough limestone, I could feel my whole body trying to rebel, trying to stop me from going farther. But there wasn't any going back at this point. Crawling forwards was difficult enough. Crawling backwards would have been impossible. So I kept going, mentally telling myself to shut the hell up and push forward. Soldier crawling, by the way, is a lot of damn work. You'd think climbing thirty feet up a rock wall is tough, but crawling on your belly, wriggling in the dirt, a hard floor below you and a sharp rock ceiling scraping at you from above is exhausting. You use every muscle you have, even some you didn't know existed. Despite the icy cold of the cave behind me, I was now drenched in sweat, the salty drops falling into my eyes, burning until I could free one of my hands to wipe them away. But I kept at it, scrapes and sweat and exhaustion be damned. Every so often I would stop 
holding my phone in front of me to see where I was going, but it didn't illuminate much. The rock extended out for what seemed like forever. It was about as disheartening as you can imagine, no end in sight, but Google had said I needed to go forward 30 yards. I'd reach the end soon enough, and I did reach the end. I had been crawling in the godforsaken rocky tomb for at least half an hour, if not longer, when Google finally spoke up again. In ten feet, exit into the passage ahead. Praise the Lord. Once Google told me I only needed to drag myself a few more feet, I was re-energized. I felt stronger, more resilient. I pressed forward foot by foot until I felt the edge of the crack in front of me. I could feel the cold air on my scratched and worn hands. I grabbed the edge and made to pull myself forward, and then I got stuck. For a second I thought I had just braced myself up against the rock awkwardly, but then I tried to move my leg again and it wouldn't budge. It had wedged itself between the ceiling and the floor. I tried to look back see if I could unstick myself, but it was pitch black, and then I did something really stupid. As my panic began to grow, I moved my phone hand around trying to shine the light toward my leg and that's when I dropped it. I could hear it clatter on the ground below, maybe ten feet down. I lost my composure. As I struggled to free my leg, I could feel the ceiling push in. I could feel the floor rise up. My other leg soon lodged between the rock as well, refusing to move. I reached one arm down, trying to pull my leg free, but it brought me at an odd angle, and I found myself on my side, wedged tightly in the rock, completely immobile. I tried everything I could to no avail. More than once I thrashed against the rocks and banged my head hard against the ceiling. I could feel the stone cutting into my arms, peeling away at my skin. As the rocks seemed to close in around me, my breathing became erratic. My blood pulsed past my eardrums, and I could feel the pounding of my heart as it threatened to jump straight out of my chest. And then I could feel the rock around me, drumming alongside me, as if the cave was alive. A deep, moving thrum joining my heart in a psychotic rhythm. And once again I could feel the walls pressing in as I began to thrash once more, trying to free myself, trying to haul myself out of that damned crack in the rock. I could feel my lungs going, my panicked breaths becoming shorter and weaker, failing to fill with the air I needed. I could have sworn my ribs began to crack, and at long last, I let out a piercing wail. A desperate cry for help and over my screaming in the darkness ahead I heard it. Do not struggle. Be still. I stopped dead. It was a little distant, but definitely audible. If you struggle, you will stay stuck. You must relax. Google was calling out to me from wherever I had dropped it. And for some reason it worked. That damn phone had done nothing but annoy the hell out of me all day, and now in the middle of hell it calmed me down. I stopped thrashing. I stopped screaming. I stopped trying to free my limbs from the rocky vise around me. Sooth. I obeyed the phone, taking in the air as slowly and as calmly as possible. I could feel the rock tighten around me as I filled my lungs, but I ignored it. I closed my eyes and just focused on my breathing, on my heartbeat. I shut out everything else. The cuts, the bruises, the rocks, the sweat, the blood. And at long last I could almost feel the rock pull away, as if it had decided to finally just let me go. From the darkness, Google's voice rang once again. Exit the passage ahead. And I did. I had relaxed enough that, with a little rocking back and forth, I could free my arm from my side. Once I was back on my belly, I kicked my legs back and felt them dislodge from the rock behind me. And then I grabbed the edge of the crack with both my aching arms and pulled myself out into the cave. Luckily, the drop wasn't as high as I thought, maybe five feet. I tumbled to the ground and flopped over onto my back, gulping in the damp, cool air of the open passage. I lay there for what must have been ten minutes and Google must have been trying to be considerate because I didn't hear a peep for a long time. And then once I had regained my composure, a light a few feet to my left turned on and Google spoke. Continue left down the path for a half a mile. I sighed and pulled myself up onto an elbow, reached out and grabbed my phone. Luckily the screen hadn't cracked in the fall. I looked at it bemusedly. Really? I can't rest for five more minutes. Continue left down the path for a half mile. I rolled my eyes and hauled myself onto my feet, maybe a little too quickly. 
My body cried out from the bruises and cuts and stiff muscles, but I shook it off and half walked, half limped my way down the passage. Luckily, none of the half mile was interesting. No squeezing through fissures, no climbing cliffs, no creepy, unexplainable darkness ahead. And then slowly but surely, the darkness around me seemed to lighten. The walls around me became clearer and more defined, and I was able to switch the flashlight on my phone off. I was rounding a corner when Google spoke up. In 100 feet, enter the light. And sure enough, 100 feet ahead, a shining point in the distance was the tunnel exit. Bright light poured into the tunnel, and I could almost feel the warmth on my skin, cutting through the frigid air of the cave. My heart skipped a beat and my spirits began to lift. A smile crept over my face as I walked toward the light, happy to be leaving this dank hellhole at last. As it turns out, the light was even worse. It's part 3. Seeing the light at the end of the tunnel had raised my spirits higher than they had been all day. I quickened my step, eagerly approaching the light, ready to get out of that damned cave. I was only a yard or two away from it when Google piped up suddenly. Close your eyes when you're in the light. I stopped dead. Suddenly the light seemed a little less friendly. Why? I asked, eyeing the light with hesitation. Close your eyes when you're in the light and do not open them. Are you always going to be this friggin' cryptic? Sugal remained silent. I sighed, rolling my eyes. Of course my day couldn't be getting better. That would be silly. I peered out into the bright portal ahead of me. Try as I might, I couldn't see past the blinding brilliance of it. No trees, no landscapes, nothing. It was just a big, shining wall of light. What could possibly be in there that I wasn't supposed to see? But after Google helped me pull myself out of that crack in the wall, I honestly wasn't going to be too stubborn about following its directions, so I clenched my eyes shut and stepped through the exit of the cave and into the light. As I passed into the light, the darkness that blotted out my vision turned a brilliant, hot white, and then, just as quickly, it faded into a dull, glowing pink as the light filtered through my eyelids. The oppressive chill of the cave was soon replaced by a cozy warmth. A gentle breeze blew through my hair, carrying with it the scent of flowers and moss. I was definitely outside. I was tempted to open my eyes, see what was around me. Google seemed to be reading my mind. Do not open your eyes. Okay, okay, I mumbled, keeping them shut. What do I do now? Continue forward for twenty feet. Do you ever walk with your eyes closed just to see how it would be to be blind? It's not easy. But at least when you're pretending, you can just open your eyes again before you stub your toe on a coffee table or run into a wall. But when you have to keep your eyes shut, it sucks. A lot. I proceeded forward as best I could, shuffling my feet and hoping I didn't catch a root and send myself sprawling face first into the dirt. I held my hands out ahead of me, waving them in wide arcs back and forth so I wouldn't break my nose on a tree or rock wall or any other thing that would spring up in front of me. But step after step, my path remained clear. Take a right and proceed for fifty feet. I did as I was told. As I walked along, eyes still clenched shut, I began to hear the twittering of birds and the dry rustling of leaves. To be honest, it was kind of a lovely walk in the woods, aside from the creepy warnings from my phone. I walked that way for quite a while, ten, maybe twenty minutes. Time is a little harder to gauge with your eyes closed. Every so often, Google would order me to turn and I obeyed. So far I hadn't eaten dirt or run into anything. My feet had gone from a hesitant shuffle to a slightly more confidant gait. I kept my arms up, just in case. Still, my mood was lighter, my spirits higher, and then I heard it. Off in the distance, faint but clear, sobbing, I stopped in my tracks. Oh God, I moaned. What the hell is that? continue forward for 60 feet. Towards the crying? Google didn't respond. I could feel the hesitation beginning to build up once more. But I didn't have much of a choice, so I gave my arms and legs a little shake to throw off my nerves and continued forward. As I walked, I could hear the sobbing grow louder and louder. I was most definitely moving towards it. Great. As I grew closer, I could tell it wasn't your average crying either. It wasn't the soft, gentle weeping of a quiet funeral. It was loud and pained, at times it ratcheted up to a full-on wail. 
These were the heaving sobs of pure, unadulterated grief. It was one of the most unnerving things I've ever heard in my life, and I was getting uncomfortably close. After a minute or so, when it felt like I was nearly on top of the grieving stranger, the sobbing cut off, replaced by dead quiet. Let me tell you something. If creepy weeping in the woods is scary, it's infinitely scarier when it stops dead. I stopped walking, straining my ears, hoping to catch a whimper, a sigh. What I heard was worse. Running. I could hear the pounding of feet, the rapid crunching of leaves, the heaving, hurried breaths. And it was coming straight for me. My whole body clenched, my raised my hands even higher in front of me. I nearly screamed out. Google chimed in. Do not move. I froze where I was, listening in terror as whatever it was continued to rush towards me, coming closer and closer. Twenty feet. Fifteen. Ten. I braced for impact, but it didn't come. Instead, I could hear whatever it is throw itself down onto the floor in front of me. I could hear its frenzied, ragged breaths. They didn't seem angry or aggressive. They sounded scared, desperate. Oh, thank God, it was the voice of a young woman. A terrified young woman. Please, please you have to help me. They're coming for me. Google, once again, must have been reading my mind because it spoke up immediately. Do not open your eyes. My breath caught in my chest. I clenched my eyes harder, fighting the urge to look upon the young woman. Fighting the urge to help her. There was silence for a moment, and then the woman spoke up again. What are you doing? Here voice was confused, scared. Please, please you have to get me home. I don't know where I am. Her voice was the most helpless thing I had ever heard in my life. Pathetic and desperate. It was breaking my heart. Was I just going to listen to a stupid phone? Could I really just do nothing while this helpless girl languished in the middle of the woods? For all I knew, her own damn phone brought her out here too and just left her here to die. I wrestled with my conscience for what felt like minutes. She never stopped pleading. For the love of God, please, she yelled. Please help me. That is not a girl. Do not open your eyes. Those words almost knocked the wind out of me. What do you mean it's not a girl? What the hell is it? But before I could ask, before I could barely process what Google was saying, there was screaming in the distance, and it sure as hell was no girl. It wasn't even human. They were primal, bestial screams. Screams of rage and fury. And hunger. I could almost feel the girl, or whatever it was in front of me, tense up. So oh God, they've found me, she screamed. We have to go. Now. Do not move. Do not open your eyes. I kept my eyes shut. I don't know why. I don't know why I decided to listen to Google instead of my own two ears. But I did. Looking back, thank God I did. At the time, it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. It wasn't long before I heard the rushing of footsteps harder, more frantic than the young woman's. The woods around me exploded with noise, the rushing of footsteps, the crunching of leaves, the rough, guttural huffing of the creatures bearing down on us. The wailing. No! The girl screamed, pleaded, but not with me. She seemed to be talking to whatever was barreling towards us. No, 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 please. But they didn't listen, they didn't even slow down. In a matter of seconds they descended on her, their furious yowling soon accompanied by rending and tearing. And then the girl screaming joined them. I can still hear it as I type. It's given me nightmares ever since. It was a high-pitched ululation, a keening wail of pain and sorrow and betrayal. Help, she screamed. Help me. But I stood still. I kept my eyes shut. And then Google seemed to shout at me. So. My blood chilled as the soft, electronic voice told me to get the hell out. And then I ran. I pounded the earth as hard as I could, and as I ran, I could hear the girl screaming after me. Don't leave me. Don't leave me here, for the love of God. But I didn't stop. And as I ran, as her screaming grew farther and farther away, I could hear it cut out suddenly, replaced by a strangled gurgling until that too was silenced, buried in the cacophony of howling and growling and tearing. And the whole time, I kept my eyes shut trying to run from the fear, from the chaos, from the guilt. And then I could hear them behind me, their feet pounding against the ground. They were after me. Faster. I kicked into second gear, tearing up the ground, 
heaving myself forward at full speed as the growls and inhuman screams grew closer and closer, and every so often Google would shout directions. In five seconds, turn right. Continue forward for 20 seconds. In 10 seconds, turn left. I did my best to follow the directions, trying to focus on counting off the seconds through my panic. And steadily, the frenzied yells of the monsters seemed to taper off until they were far in the distance. My heart began to slow down. I was getting away. I barely had time to huff out a laugh when my foot caught a root and I went sprawling forward face first into the dirt. My brain went into full-on panic mode. They were going to get me. They were going to rip me to shreds. My feet slid in the dirt, failing to gain traction. I had to get up. I had to move. And then I stopped. I held my head up, craned it left and right. The bestial cries had ceased. I could no longer hear the rushing of feet, the snapping of twigs. For a long moment, the only sound I could hear was my own shuddering breath. I felt my whole body relax. I had escaped. Thank God I had escaped. But I also knew that they could be back any second. I had to get up. I turned my head back around, pulled myself onto my knees, and reached down to the ground to push myself up. And my hand landed on a foot. It was clammy and cold like a dead fish. My blood froze in my veins. And then I could hear whatever it was struggling to breathe. This breathe heavy and wet and ragged. I could hear it bend over, its joints popping and cracking as it moved. And then it spoke, its fetid breath washing over me, nearly knocking me flat. You left me to die, it croaked. And I knew the voice immediately. It was different than before, the sounds struggling past ripped and mangled vocal cords, but I knew it. The girl. It was the girl. You let them tear me to shreds, she whispered angrily, fury slowly building in her voice. You let them rip my heart out. I didn't even try to apologize. Dead girls don't rise from the grave. Whatever it was, it wasn't a girl. I didn't hesitate. I sprung forward, slamming past whatever it was, bowling it over and scrambling on hands and knees, trying to get up, trying to get the hell away. I could feel its hands tearing after me, raking across my back and down my legs. And then a skeletal hand gripped my ankle and held tight like a vise. My breath caught in my chest for a second before I began to kick back, trying to shake the dead girl off, trying to pull myself free. Soured, it screamed. You left me to die. I gave my leg one more frantic kick, shoving back with all my strength. Her grasp broke and I bolted to my feet, flying off into the depths of the woods. You left me to die. My heart pounded against my rib cage and I fled blindly, hands stretched forward, legs pumping wildly. You left me to die. Her furious accusations warped into a deep, otherworldly groan, culminating in a frenzied cry of rage so loud I could feel it in my molars. It tore through me, hammering into my eardrums, nearly tumbling me to the ground. Google spoke up. Continue forward for 100 yards. And with that, I shut everything out. My racing heart, the sweat pouring down my face, the raging fury of the dead girl behind me. I dug my feet into the ground even deeper, pounding through the landscape like a madman, adrenaline pouring through my veins. And after I had been running for a good 20-30 seconds, the light against my eyelids switched off and Google piped up. Stop. But it was too late. I ran full force into a wall, bouncing off and flying flat onto my back. My body exploded in pain. I lay there stunned for a moment before letting out a low groan. You couldn't have said stop sooner, I moaned. Google didn't seem to care. Open your eyes. I nearly cried in relief. Google may as well have said, you've won a million dollars. I slowly opened my tired, weary eyes and stared up into the darkness. I wasn't in a forest. I wasn't even outside. I was still in the damn cave. I pushed myself up off the ground and turned around to where I had run from. I was on a high slope at the edge of a huge underground cavern. It was dark, but I could see almost to the other side. I craned my head upward and could see a large hole in the ceiling, maybe 100 feet up, light filtering down, spreading a dim glow to the floor below, a floor covered in rocky outcroppings and a dense, murky cloud of fog. There were no trees, no leaves, no birds, no pleasant breezes, just darkness and fog. What the hell? I whispered. What happened to the forest? 
helps you hear what it makes you hear. You feel what it makes you feel. It needs you to gaze upon it. What does? I asked breathlessly. But before Google could respond, something moved down below. I couldn't make it out, but the fog in the cavern shifted. Something was down there, and it was huge. My knees nearly gave out as I took a few weak steps back. Google wasn't phased. Open the door. Google's voice broke my trance, and I pulled my attention away from the fog, away from the gigantic thing below. And as I turned, I saw what I had run into. They were enormous wooden double doors, at least two stories tall. Two monstrous metal knockers lay in the center of each, studded metal lining the edges. I walked up cautiously, stretched out my hand, and felt the rough, ancient wood beneath my fingers. How the hell do I open this thing? I asked. Push. I nearly snorted. This thing is huge. I can't push these open. Push. I sighed. Fine, I huffed, and then leaned against the left-hand door, bracing my feet on the floor and shoving hard against it with my shoulder. And wouldn't you know it, it moved. Despite the size, the doors moved much easier than I was expecting. They didn't exactly fly open, but with a few rough pushes, I was able to force open a space big enough for me to squeeze through. Google spoke up. Enter. I held my breath for a moment. I wasn't sure I was ready for what was behind the door. I didn't know if my mind could take it. But then I looked back into the cavern behind me, into the roiling fog that held a living nightmare, and I realized I had to enter. So I squeezed my way through the crack in the door and gazed into the room before me, and my jaw dropped to the floor. Final part. It took me a few moments to take in the space that greeted me on the other side of the gigantic double doors. It was a coliseum, and it was huge. The size of a modern NFL stadium. It stretched before me in a huge circle, the seats carved into the rock all the way around, and it was incredibly well lit. That's because there was no ceiling. Blinding daylight poured into the cavern from an open roof, the sky above a pale blue. But that's not what made my jaw drop. The floor of the Colosseum had been torn open, a big gaping hole smack in the middle, and rising out of that hole was something out of a nightmare. It was like someone had fused a man with a crab and a spider. Dozens of slender, jointed legs as long as football fields sprouted everywhere from its scaly body, erupting at odd angles, bracing the beast against the sides of the cavern, propping it up from the floor, and stretching out, seemingly cutting through the air. It seemed to be pulling itself out of the depths of the earth, rising up to greet the sky. It had a torso like a man, albeit covered in chitinous plates of armor, short spikes bristling over its chest, up its arms and over onto its back. Its strong, muscular arms reached up over its head, terminating in twisted hands which were open and grasping at the sky, claws the size of trees protruding from its fingertips. And then there was the head. It's hard for me to describe it. I don't have any real-life thing to compare it to, but I knew the look on its face. It was fury. Pure, unfiltered rage painted over a face of scales and protruding ridges and more teeth than I could count. Its mouth gaped wide open, twisted and contorted into a voiceless roar. It was deformed and unnatural. I'd never seen anything like it. I almost screamed. I could feel my chest tightening, ready to let loose a piercing shriek. But the scream never came. Google stopped me short. It is not alive. I jumped at Google's voice, stared down at the phone in my hand, and then looked back up at the demonic beast before me. And Google was right. I had been so blown over at the sight of it that my brain hadn't registered that it wasn't moving. It wasn't alive. It was a statue. The biggest statue I've ever seen in my life. It was the size of a skyscraper. Hundreds, possibly a thousand feet tall. It was hard to tell with something of that scale. All I do know for sure is that it dwarfed the stadium, casting wide shadows throughout the cavern. It was damn realistic, too. So much so that I was still having trouble processing it as a statue. Even from a distance, I could see the details perfectly. Every spike, every scale, every tooth and joint and nail. I don't know how long it must have taken to make this thing, but it must have been years, maybe even decades. Let's continue forward. I looked back at Google for a moment. I really wasn't keen on getting closer to that thing. Impressive as it was, it was still terrifying. Let's continue forward. I closed my eyes and sighed. Fine. 
Let's take a closer look. I proceeded slowly, step after halting step, never taking my eyes off the gargantuan statue. Part of me was convinced that the closer I got, the more likely the colossal beast would come alive, reach out with its deformed hands and snatch me up. But it didn't move. And after a few tense moments, I had walked from the door to the edge of the Colosseum. I stood at the top of a long set of steps that stretched hundreds of feet down to the floor below. I groaned. I knew what was coming next. Succeed to the bottom. Damn it. Fine, whatever. And so I went, step by step by step, descending deeper into the bowels of the Colosseum. As I climbed down the stairs, I noticed two things. First, as I drew closer and closer to the abominable statue, I became convinced that whatever it was depicting was real. I don't know why I became convinced of this. It's almost as if the knowledge just planted itself firmly in my brain. This thing had existed somewhere and some time. I knew it like I know that water is wet. At some point in time, this thing roamed the earth, and that knowledge shook me to me bones. I nearly had to stop when the thought hit me. It didn't seem possible, but I knew it was true. As I continued down the steps, I could only hope that it had died a long time ago. I wasn't so sure I could count on that, though. The second thing I noticed were the other statues. I was about halfway down the steps when I began to make them out. The statue of the raging beast was so huge it was easy to miss the others. But there were thousands of them arranged around the beast in concentric circles, each one getting bigger as they spread out from the creature like waves of water, continuing until they hit the seats at the edges of the stadium. It wasn't until I was near the bottom, though, that I could make out what they were. They were people. Each statue was a full-scale replica of a human being, and each and every one lay prostrate on the ground, their faces buried in the dirt, their arms lying flat in front of them, their legs folded beneath them. As I stepped out onto the floor of the Colosseum, I wandered close to one, leaning in to inspect it, half expecting Google to tell me to stop. But Google didn't say a word. The statue in front of me was different from the gigantic hell beast. Unlike the beast, the statue of the human was featureless and smooth. It was less a reproduction of a human as it was a blank template of one. Bending over, I could get a glimpse of where its face would be, but there wasn't one there. Standing back up, I swept my eyes over the stadium floor. All of them were like this. Smooth, featureless, more stone than human. Looking back up at the beast in front of me, at the intricacies and loving attention to detail, I understood why. It wasn't laziness. It wasn't to save time. It wasn't because there were too many to spare any attention to detail to. It was purposeful. It was a statement. Compared to the nightmarish demon rising from the depths, humanity was nothing. They didn't warrant any attention to detail. They were meaningless, replaceable, interchangeable in comparison to the glory of the monster before them. The only value they had was to prostrate themselves before the beast for mercy, for hope, out of sheer devotion. I could feel the bile in my stomach begin to churn. Clearly whoever built these statues held an amount of reverence for the thing from the depths. I held no such reverence. I couldn't scrounge up an ounce of awe for something who could view us like this. I could feel the anger begin to boil my blood when Google interrupted. To approach the statue. I didn't even stop to wait for Google to finish. I knew where this was going. I began to stride toward the behemoth, my steps growing longer and faster. As I made my approach past the throngs of empty human bodies, I could feel the resentment bubbling up. I had been put through hell for this. I endured unknown horrors for whatever this thing was. And I had no choice. I had no way back. So screw it, you big scaly bastard, you want me, you can have me. You want to swallow me up into that hole. Fine. Let's just end this. Now. Soon I passed under the shadow of the demon, the light around me dimming, and ahead I could see where I was going. A small set of stairs rose from the floor of the stadium, butted up against the massive fissure in the rock and atop that staircase was a landing with a large, vertical stone slab, maybe ten feet tall, a small hole halfway up the surface. To climb the stairs. I ignored it again. I didn't need its directions. I approached the foot of the landing and looked up at the foreboding stone wall at the top. I took a deep breath and began my climb. And as I reached the top of the steps, Google's voice rang in the silence of the Colosseum. 
like you have reached your destination. I just stood there, staring at the rock wall in front of me. It was covered in deeply carved runes from top to bottom, the characters forming intricate swirls and loops and waves across the surface, all culminating around the hole in the center, wrapping around it like the coils of a python. And I knew I would have to reach into that damn hole. It was pretty damn obvious. As I said by this time, I was basically over the whole thing, so I was about as ready as I ever would be to just shove my hand right in and let whatever happened happen. But I stopped for just a moment, peered into the hole in front of me. It was oppressively black like a solid wall of darkness. I couldn't see anything past the stone wall, and despite the fact that the wall itself seemed to only be a couple feet thick at best in my gut, I could tell that the hole extended much, much farther. I craned my head up at the evil stone bastard looming over me. Is this what you want? Fine, you can have it. And I shoved my arm into the hole. At first, I didn't feel a thing. I figured I'd at least feel some kind of extreme cold of the void or something, but it was almost pleasantly warm. I shook my arm around a bit to see if anything would happen, but it was almost disappointingly uneventful. I had my hand dangling in the void for close to a minute, and was considering pulling it out when it happened. Faster than I could process it, something cold and wet wrapped tightly around my arm. I yelled in shock. It traveled from my hand up to my elbow and pulled hard, slamming my body into the rocky wall. I could feel it tightening over me. I struggled to pull my arm out. I didn't have any delusions that I could win this fight, but I was pissed enough to not let it take me easily. I couldn't tell what it was exactly, whether it was a tentacle or a tongue, but it was somehow smooth and rough at the same time, traveling over my skin like slimy sandpaper, threatening to tear the flesh off of my arm. The grip tightened even more and I was certain it was about to snap my arm in two. I could feel the force against my bones, pushing them to their limits, my arm screaming from the pressure, and then it bit me, or something like that. My arm exploded in white-hot flames, and I felt tens of thousands of needles plunge deep into my skin, burrowing into the muscle. My screams sliced through the air, my head reared back, my mouth wide open. I could feel the needles pulsing in and out, in and out, joined soon by what felt like hundreds of little mouths, sucking hungrily, lapping up the blood as the needles drew more and more of it up to the surface of my arm. And as the pain threatened to shut me down, to turn my brain off, I looked up at the nightmare creature above me, glared at it in defiance. Kill me if you want, I thought. Take what you want from me, but I'm going to be an asshole about it. You aren't getting any reverence from me. And with every ounce of strength I had, I raised up my free arm and gave the hell beast the finger. And then as quickly as it started, the tentacle thing let go, like it had straight up vanished into thin air and my arm came loose from the hole. I nearly fell backwards down the stairs, but was able to steady myself, wobbling a little precariously at the edge of the steps. Honestly, I was a little surprised to still be alive, let alone still have my arm. It took a few seconds to sink in, and then I examined my arm, expecting my skin to be gone, my arm bloody and mangled beyond recognition. But it was completely intact. It was utterly fine. With one small difference. From my elbow to my wrist was an intricate black tattoo. Snaking around my arm like a series of tentacles, runes like the ones on the stone wall were imprinted deep into my skin. I touched them apprehensively. I felt nothing. It's like I'd had them my whole life. I looked up at the stone wall to compare the ones there to the ones on my arm. But the stone wall was blank. Smooth as glass. I looked back at my arm. What the hell just happened? And then before I could say anything, a voice boomed throughout the cavern, shaking the walls, nearly tossing me off the landing to the floor below. It is done. You may ascend. I looked up the second I heard the voice to the massive statue, pretty much convinced the damn thing had come to life and was about to ruin my day, but it stood still, lifeless. After a breathless minute of staring up at the beast, checking for any signs of life, I turned back to the stairs and nearly pissed myself. The human statues had moved. Every single one of them, thousands upon thousands of them, now stood up, their arms raised high in adoration at the beast, their blank faces somehow still conveying worship and praise. My whole body shivered. And in the midst of them, a couple dozen feet from the bottom of the landing, 
was a huge winding stone staircase. My eyes followed it as it wound upwards and into the sky above. I guess that's what the voice meant by ascend. I gave one more cursory glance around the cavern and descended the stairs, heading past the creepy blank human puppets and straight for the winding staircase. I didn't stop to think this time. I just began to climb. I didn't know where they were taking me, whether it was to another chamber or home or heaven or hell. All I knew was that I wanted to get out of there. I don't know how long it took to climb the steps. I just pressed forward, eyes glued to the top, ignoring the ache of my legs, the sweat plastering my shirt to my back, the heaving of my tired lungs. And eventually I was at the top. There were only a dozen or so stairs left to go. The light blue sky opened up above me and I could feel the wind on my face. I closed my eyes and breathed in the fresh air. Then I gave one more look down into the hellhole I had climbed up from. The disgusting monstrosity was far below, its arms stretched up in rage. I couldn't see the humans below it, but I couldn't care less about them. And after a few moments of glaring at the blasphemous creature below with a deep sense of loathing, I turned back and ascended the stairs, and then my vision was blotted out by a blinding white light. And then I was back at the truck. Just like that, just standing at the driver's side door. I looked around for a second. Had I just zoned out? Had I been hallucinating? But then I lifted up my arm. The tattoo was there, wrapping around my arm. It was real. It happened. And it was over. Now I could go home. I didn't waste any time. I fished my keys out of my pocket, unlocked the door, and climbed into the truck. As I was taking my seat, Google spoke up again. I ignored it, unlocking my phone and closing Google Maps. Luckily, I had a signal, so I downloaded Waze because screw you Google Maps. Then I punched in my address and headed home. I got there no problem. No detours into the unknown, no sketchy directions. I arrived home under a starlit sky. I unlocked the door, walked straight to my bed, and collapsed. I don't know how long I slept, but by the time I got up, it must have been well after noon. I checked my arm once more, hoping it would be a dream, but the tattoo remained, reminding me that I couldn't forget what happened the day before. I got up and took a shower to wash all the sweat and dirt from my little foray into the cave. Then as I was entering the living room, I spied an envelope on the floor right at my front door. Someone had dropped it through the mail slot while I was asleep. I walked over, picked it up, and flipped it over. In bold magic marker, the word couch was scrawled across the front. I opened it up. It was filled with an absurd amount of cash. And so I went ahead and bought the best damn couch I could find. Seriously, it has seat warmers. I even had enough left over for a huge flat screen TV and a kick-ass stereo system. And as I sit on my awesome couch and binge Netflix in 4K and think back to everything I had to go through to get them, I realize that I was royally boned in that particular transaction. Seriously, screw those guys, whoever they are. And every so often, I just sit there in my living room, running my fingers over the runes inked into my arm. Runes that aren't the same every time I wake up. And I think back to the last thing Google said as I entered my truck and goosebumps break out over my skin. When he comes, answer the call. Thanks for listening. If you like our work, do subscribe because your support helps us keep this channel alive.